Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in San Diego. Presented by Jesus on the 2nd of November 2013 in San Diego, California, USA. This is session 1, part 1. <sighs> Pleased to meet you. Yeah, pleased to meet you. Many of you, probably, uh, some of you have been watching our videos for two, three, four years. <laughs> Never met us. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's only 10 to 1. So we've still got 10 more minutes before we start. You're very uh, obedient uh, <laughs> sitting 10 minutes before you begin. It's amazing. No, no. <laughs> Just <laughs> I'm happy to have an informal chat with you now together <laughs> for the next 10 minutes while we're waiting for others to come. <clears throat> now, um, if I just explain to most of you what we do, basically um, we have two cameras. One usually is facing myself and Mary when we're talking up front. And that... Uh, that's the camera Mary's operating. And Cornelius is operating this camera, which is an audience camera. And the reason why we do that is so that when you're asking questions or whatever, we can zoom in on you. It's an automatic assumption that you give our approval to do that if you ask a question. Now, if you don't want that to happen and you don't want your face on the internet, my suggestion is to not ask the question. <laughs> because it's going to happen if you ask the question. Um, or get somebody else to ask the question, if that's what you want to do. We, we do that because people learn a lot from your questions. They learn a tremendous amount from your questions. And so you'll find it's very, very beneficial to other people. Uh, just as you would have found, other people's questions have probably been very beneficial for yourself as you've listened to the answers that have been given. So um, that's what we generally do. And your attendance here basically indicates your acceptance of that. So I just wanted to say that. Um, we have had people request that we edit them out afterwards, and we don't. So I just warn you that in, about that in advance. The main reason why we do it that way is because we want an accurate record of everything that happened during our seminar without it being edited or manipulated in some way. And so many of you would know that we've got the YouTube channels that... Uh, do all of you know that there's two YouTube channels now? There's, 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 a, there's the normal YouTube channel called Divine Truth Channel. And then we have another one called Divine Truth FAQs, or Frequently Asked Question Channel. And uh, we're now adding videos to that channel. And in fact, those videos are much shorter. And when I say much shorter, some of them are five minutes long only, in terms of one question, one answer. But on the average, they'd be a quarter of an hour long in comparison to two hours long. But at the moment, there's around 1,200 hours of material on YouTube, of video material. There's also um, around about the same amount of hours of audios on our website. And there's also quite a lot of printed material now. There's a whole teams around the world working on translating a lot of the material and transcribing the material. So pretty much every seminar uh, eventually is going to be transcribed. But at the moment, there's... 60 seminars that have been edited and transcribed and are all available as a printed document on our website as well. So there's quite a lot of material. And most people find that there's far too much material for them <laughs> to absorb. Mary needs to adjust me. That's all right. It should be. As long as it doesn't scratch. Yeah, if I smile too much. <laughs> my whiskers rub on, Igor complains at me when my whiskers rub on my microphone. Should be all right, shouldn't it? Can't hear that. <clears throat> now, um, the format today basically is going to be I'm at your disposal for... Not, not to do anything. <laughs> That's just to ask, answer your questions. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have today. 
and, uh, and we'll do the same thing tomorrow. What myself and Mayor have decided to do a few months ago now is we've decided that new material generally would not be presented in seminar format because we find that when we present the new material in seminars, there's so many questions that people have about it that often we don't get to present all the material we want to present during that seminar. Whereas what we're doing now is myself and Mary generally have a discussion together that's just filmed privately about that particular topic. And, uh, and then we put that information on YouTube and then we feel that there's an opportunity for any of you to ask questions about any of that information or anything else for that matter in these kind of seminar formats. So what we try to do with the seminars now is just interact with each with the audience rather than presenting new material. So you won't have any new material presented during this seminar, although you might find there's quite confronting things presented if you ask questions about uh, different subjects and topics. But that, the reason why we do that now is because we feel that we want to get as much of the actual truth about the material across as possible and then give people the freedom to ask whatever questions they like. So if you don't get to ask your question about any material that you've heard or any new thing that you want to know about, send your questions to the FAQ line on our website, which is, I'll just write that on the board. It's just FAQ at divinetruth.com. So if you just send it to that address, you'll find that, um, that we have a, a few people, or a couple of uh, women who get those FAQs, and what they do is they categorise it into different uh, subjects, and they add it to the subject list of that category. So unfortunately, for some questions that people ask, there might be 200 other questions already in that category. So that means that your question might not get answered for quite a few months or, or even longer, unfortunately. But that's the best way that we've got to handle it. And what Yself and Mary do is we get all of those questions that people have asked and we read every one of them. And then we try to categorise them in some kind of priority system. Does that make sense? In a priority so that we can, go, we, we can do the um, questions in some kind of order. That's what we're trying to do. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Oh, by the way, um, we've got two microphone handlers. Who are our microphone handlers? Uh, so if you just put up your hands. If you can wait for them, if you put up your hand and I point to you, just wait for them to hand you the mic. And if you leave your hand up, they'll know where you are. And just wait for them to give you the mic and, uh, and then speak into the mic. If I can have one of those mics just to show you how to speak into it. Thank you. So... Don't do this with the mic, because it's not very helpful for you got to hear your sound. Speak into it so that you've got the mic held pretty closely to you, and you can see the angle. And then if you're going to gesture, make sure you gesture with one hand. And if you're going to move around, make sure the microphone moves around with you. Right. Otherwise, the audience doesn't hear you, but also when it comes to the recording later, nobody can actually hear you either. So it's far better if you can move around with the mic. Is that all right? So you get the opportunity to do that when you ask a question. Thanks. So for how many of you is this your first seminar that you've ever been to? So almost everyone. Yep. So welcome. Welcome. How many of you have listened on YouTube for quite a lot of time, though, or, or at least some time, so quite a lot of you? So you know sort of what to expect, to a degree. Yep. You'll find myself and Mary friendly in the most part. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just a joke. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> we're friendly all the time. <laughs> no. The only time we've ever removed somebody from our seminars, of course, these are free seminars, so you know, the only time we remove somebody from our seminars is if we feel they, that they have a lot of anger towards us uh, personally, um, because we feel that it's not nice to have people projecting anger at us, or if we feel that somebody is being distractive or, or disruptive to the rest of the audience. So that under those circumstances, we remove people, but generally, anybody can come at any time to any of our seminars. So, um, you know, that, that's generally the case. 
There are some people we've asked not to come again, though, because they've been angry with us for a long period of time and they come to the seminars and project their anger at us and so we feel like we don't deserve that, so we've asked them to not come. But uh, for the most part, most people are like yourselves, smiling faces and quite, quite generally engaged. So, um, so I'm sure we're going to enjoy each other's company. What is the time now? One o'clock. I am starting. I'm officially, officially starting. Okay. Well, the first thing we'd like to do is thank um, those of you who were engaged in getting us here. As you probably are aware, myself and Mary don't have a large amount of personal funds and we rely on the donations of other people to go to different locations around the world. And it's the desires of people that eventually cause us to go to a certain location. And it was the desire of, firstly, just one person who emailed us, Carolyn Marie, and, uh, and she emailed us almost a year ago, it would have been now, Carolyn, said, when are you coming to the States next? And we said, well, whenever anybody in the States wants us to come, <laughs> we'll come. And it's taken about that long to arrange things uh, with regard to uh, funds and so forth, to pay for our flights and so forth to come, and our accommodation and so forth. Now, there is a donation box uh, somewhere up the back, is it, on that side? If you wish to donate, please don't feel like you have to. It's only if you wish to donate uh, to, to defray some of the expenses. Um, of course, an auditorium like this does cost, I think it costs about $1,000 to hire this auditorium for the two days, and we've hired the speakers and so forth as well. So there's been costs associated with it. So if you'd like to help with defraying some of those costs, if you can just put some donations up the back there and we'll give those donations to the firstly to the people who've helped us to pay for a lot of the things to get us here. Mary and I, as you probably am aware, are aware, um, we live off the donations of, that people give us and people have been very generous with it. We have a, quite a comfortable life. We don't have a high needs, we're not high needs people, so we don't have a high need life. Um, on the average, we we usually give ourselves about $20,000 a year to live on and then the rest of the money that we receive goes towards doing things like this, paying for the seminars and paying for the hire of the seminars and paying for the equipment and we have people who are editing the videos then we donate money to them and, and things like that. We have people who are looking after uh, a email address where people can ask questions and we donate funds to them as well. So that's how we use the money. And we put, if you're worried about how we use the money, on our website we have a, a record of the last two years of our financial statements uh, as they are audited by our taxation department in, in Australia. And so you get a bit of an idea, if you look at that, how much money we receive and how much money we give and how much money we keep for ourselves. So if you're worried about those kind of things, you can look at that. But we'd like to thank you for your donations uh, and those people who did help us get here in the first place because without them we wouldn't even be here um, and there's no way we could get here by ourselves without their support. But that's about all I needed to say to start off our seminar today. This seminar is going to be called Questioners and Answers for People in San Diego. <laughs> now for that to actually occur um, you've got to ask them questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anyone feel brave enough to start? Yeah, so if we come down here first, and then we'll work our way through here. What is nothing? What is nothing? I don't feel there is any such thing as nothing, to be honest. So God always was. If you just hold the mic up. So God always was and always will be? Well, what I know about God is very limited to what I know about, in comparison to what I know about God's creation. And the reason why that is, is God existed before creation exists. And as a, as a, as a result, there are, there are certain things I know about God's personality and nature, quite a lot, in fact, about those things. Because as you receive more and more of God's love, you come to know more and more of God's character and nature. But in terms of how God got created or came into existence, I don't feel those kind of questions can be very easily answered at all. And in fact, I've been... Um, examining those kind of questions for 2,000 years now and I still don't have answers for many of them. 
the reason why uh, I actually feel like it's highly likely I will never find the answers to some of those questions. Um, because to know the answers to some questions, you would have to actually be God yourself. And I know that I'm not God. I know for certain that I'll never be God. And I'll never become a, a, a one with God in all ways. Because God is an infinite the being, as far as I'm aware, there seems to be an inc infinite capacity of love that I can receive from God. So, and it, it also, every single person who's ever asked for love from God has received it. As, uh, and, and there are many of my friends, particularly in the spirit world, who have received immense amounts of that love, and yet there still seems to be more that you can receive. So from, from our perspective, God is an infinite being. And being an infinite being and us being a finite being, it's going to be very difficult for us to understand some of the questions that we try or attempt to ask about God. I feel the more important question is, how do you experience God? And so oftentimes what we do is we focus on questions that don't necessarily or, or can never really ne have a complete answer. And then we neglect questions where we can answer everything. And, uh, and I feel there's reasons why we do that emotionally, we, that we ask certain questions and then, and then don't ask sometimes questions that have more of an impact on our day-to-day -day life. So from my perspective, if you could draw a scale, obviously um, infinite is far beyond our capacity to understand generally from a soul perspective and also from an intellectual perspective. So if we could say... If we could say this is infinite, which is impossible, of course, because there's no such thing as a scale of infinity, but let's say that's infinity, we basically are, are right down here. And then even I feel the most developed person in the universe, like the most developed beings in the universe that have received God's love into uh, to become at one with God, and then eventually they become at one with their half, other half of their soul, and that's called a soul union state, I feel that they've only grown that much in comparison to what they could grow. Does that make, does that make sense? And I feel there's still all of this growth that could occur and will occur if we still continue to receive God's love. And by the way, God's love might not be the only thing that we can receive from God. So at the moment, many of us have received God's love, but there may be other things such as knowledge and wisdom and other things that are part of God's nature that we're not even aware of at this point. And to become aware of it, we'd have to receive love to this point to become aware that we could receive other things. Does that make sense? So, so I feel asking questions about God, very important to ask. But in particular, it's very important to ask more about God's nature and character than it is about God's create or whether God was created or not created and so forth. Because some of those answers I don't think, think will ever be able to be answered by a human soul from, a, from an experience perspective. So we could postulate a lot of theories, but at the end of the day, theories don't benefit us. And they're just ideas, so I've got hundreds of them. <laughs> but you don't want to hear theories about where God came from and all those kind of things. At the end of the day, we want to find out what the facts are. But there are certain things about God's nature that we know for certain are true. For example, I know for certain that God is a God of love and never a God of anger or rage. And if you think about just that one piece of knowledge what effect it would have on the world's religions because most of the people in the world's religions believe that God does have rage in fact the Bible the Christian holy book the Bible says that God does and the Koran says that God does so most of these books say that God has rage even now this belief that God has rage is, is a defamation right defaming God's character because the reality is it doesn't exist in God and if you know that one thing about God's personality that changes your perspective of a lot of things in life right down to ooh. does that mean your power has uh, just gone down a few volts does it <laughs> all of a sudden the lights just dimmed did you notice that yeah um, or, so when it comes to God's character and nature, I feel that these are the most important questions that we can ask about God. 
And this one thing about God, that God is only loving, is not it such an important thing to understand from a soul-based perspective. And it would change most belief systems on the planet if we all understood that. Like, you, you would have to throw out most Christian belief systems based upon punishment and, uh, and those kind of systems. You'd have to throw out most Muslim-based systems based upon punishment. That would all be gone. You'd, you would also, if you were bringing your life into harmony with it, you'd have to treat your children differently. <laughs> you'd have to treat, treat each other differently just by bringing your life into harmony with that one concept. And I feel that uh, these are the important things that are going to change the world we live in. Yeah. But it is an interesting question. Where does God come from? And what, what's God's nature in terms of soul-based nature? But you're only going to understand that by getting closer to God each time and therefore having the capacity to understand. I often liken it to a man who makes a vehicle. You can make the vehicle, but the vehicle doesn't understand its maker. But the maker understands the vehicle. And it's very much the same with God. God made us. We might begin to understand some of God's nature, but, but God understands all of our nature. God understands everything about us. But it's probably going to be physically impossible for us to understand everything about God. Because if we did, we would be God. Right. So, yeah. If you hand it straight behind, and then if we come down here. So, in um, the Bible, there's many terms that are often translated as God, such as Elohim, Adonai, mm -hmm. um, Jehovah, or however you pr pronounce that. And then in the Islamic literature, you have Allah. Mm -hmm. And is, do you have anything to say about that? Like, perhaps those were the names of spirits that are being mistranslated as God? Because um, I've just had some feelings about that. I'm just curious if... Well, it, both of the religions that, that you've mentioned, particularly the, if you look at uh, the Christian religion and a lot of, a lot of its beliefs about God it started in, the Jew, in Judaism. And so if we compare Judaism with the Muslim faith, for example, there is this belief in the one true God. In Judaism, that one true God was named and it depended on whether you were referring to that one true God in terms of its feminine character or its masculine character as how you named it. If you refer to it in its feminine character, you would be talking about Yahweh or Jehovah. If you, you, if you refer, sorry, that was the masculine character. If you refer to it in the feminine character, then you were talking about Shekinah. But, but either way, you were referring to the one true God was the concept that the people had when you were talking to them. So in the first century when I spoke with people, I spoke with them about the one true God and I used the terminology they had to express that. So I used the term Jehovah. I referred to Jehovah or Yahweh as the one true God. And, um, and that God was treated in the Judaism faith as in Judaism it was treated as the only God. The, there was no joined gods with that God. There was no such thing as a trinity, for example. It was just the one true God. So it, when it comes to the Muslim faith, um, while it was channeled, so most, in fact most religions on earth are channeled material from spirits, as you would probably be aware. Now, some are blatantly obvious with regard to the channeling. So, for example, the Mormon faith, it's blatantly obvious they, there is a claim in the Mormon faith that they've channeled the Book of Mormon, you know, through Joseph Smith from Mormon, the spirit Mormon. And, and, so that, that is, and that is a very accurate reflection of what actually happened. There was a spirit who came to Joseph Smith and channeled a whole heap of information to Joseph Smith. With most other faiths, there is not that underlying claim because a lot of times the original inception of the religious faith um, was an unknown to modern society. But if you look at the Muslim religion, for example, it, there was a spirit who, who called himself Allah. And when I say called himself Allah, his name wasn't even Allah at the time, but he called himself Allah. And uh, he did a third party, what, I close, what you would call a third party channeling. In other words, he assumed he was another spirit, right? And the spirit, the other spirit was the, the, um, my, my good friend and the, 
my guide, I should remember his name, um, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. Um, and he channeled, the claim is that Gabriel channeled material to, to Muhammad from Allah. Does that make sense? But, it was, but actually there was a spirit who <laughs> channeled, Gabriel wasn't involved, a spirit did it. And, uh, and so therefore we have a whole book that was created and of course modified a little since, uh, just as the Bible has been. With regard to uh, the books of the Bible, it's very, very similar. So if you look at most of the Old Testament prophets, for example, almost all of that material is channeled. Channeled material from a spirit. And, and sometimes those spirits were in quite good condition. Certainly most of the time they were in good condition in comparison to the person on earth. But, uh, but sometimes they weren't in such good condition. And that's why sometimes some of the material feels quite off. You know, it feels against love, if you like. So most of our holy books, and, and now we have modern day ones, like the book of, uh, um, I'm just thinking about uh, the Urantia book, for example. Has anybody seen that book? Yeah, the Urantia book. Um, so it's a channeled material. Again, somebody channeled that material in the 30s, and uh, it, the way it happened was quite interesting, but again, it's just channeled material. And, and a lot of more modern ones, like The Course in Miracles and so forth, is channeled material. So there are so, much thing, there are so many things written on the planet now that are all just really channeled material from spirits. Now, of course, what we need to consider in all of that is the spirits had their own ideas. And many of these spirits had their own concepts about God, their own concepts about the universe. They're sort of like a person who knows a bit more than we do, who thinks he knows everything. Now, whenever you meet a person like that, <laughs> what do you find? <laughs> well, firstly, generally, when you meet a person who thinks they know more than you do, they are quite firm and forceful with you about what they know, right? And this is how a lot of these books come across. Like They're quite firm and forceful about you must do this and you must do that and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. A lot of rules and laws. Um, but also that kind of person who has that opinion, they will tell you things as if they are true, but, but they don't say to you, this is my current concept of what is true. All right? Now, if, if we look at truth, so here's our scale of infinity, which was impossible to achieve. <laughs> here's where we start with no knowledge at all, if we're talking about knowledge of truth. So let's say this is a scale of truth where God knows everything in the universe that is to, there is to know, and we, at the beginning, know very little. You can see that when we grow in truth to get to a certain scale, if you like, of truth, there is never really going to be a time when we can say we know all the truth. Because there is always something more to know. And, and we've got to get used to that. But a lot of people don't like that concept from an emotional perspective. What they want to do is feel that they should know everything. That's what they want to do. And so when they get to that stage, they then have a tendency to start believing they know everything, when really they know very little in comparison to the total truth. So my knowledge of truth at the moment is very, very limited. And I suggest to you that every single being other than God's knowledge of the truth in the universe is also very limited. All we can do is approach more and more truth. And this is one of the qualities of divine truth. So... If we just write that down, a quality, one of the qualities of truth, this is God's truth now that we're talking about, is that it's infinite. That being the case, it is impossible for us to ever know everything that God knows. And it will be impossible for us to ever know everything that God knows. The key is to seek more truth and still gain knowledge, and therefore you'll have a smoother life. But at the end of the day, you can't expect you're ever going to know everything. Because only God knows everything. And God's an infinite being. For us to know everything, we would have to be the same kind of infinite being that God is. And we are not. We have certain finite qualities that we can only improve by receiving things from God. Does that make sense? So we can only improve our ability to absorb truth, for example, by receiving love from God and also starting to feel that love in operation in our day-to-day -day life. And, that start, and then we start to be able to be very cut and dried, you know, very firm about what is truth and what is not. 
But that being the case, one of the qualities of divine truth is this infinite capacity to grow. Now, most, if you look at most religions on earth, and in, including things like the Bible, most of them say that there's no more truth other than this. Now, for that to be true, God's truth would have to be finite, which is actually a physical impossibility. So they're actually putting forward an explanation that they think is logical, but actually contains no logic, because they themselves often say that God is an infinite being. So how can on one hand God be an infinite being, which would mean that God's truth would be infinite in its nature, and on the other hand, a book such as a thousand-page Bible contain all of the truth? It's a physical impossibility. So all we can say about all of these books are... They contain some truth. They also, many of them, contain some error. And the reason why they contain some error is because most of the time there was a spirit in the spirit world, a person, a man or a woman, who channeled the material to people on earth. Right? They sent the material via certain communication methods to a person on earth. The person on earth wrote it down. Now, you can see straight away that there's already a number of problems with that process if we're talking about truth. Firstly, if these people believe they know all the truth, they're wrong, because it's impossible to know all the truth. And then if they channel that to this person who then believes they must have known all the truth, they're wrong, because it's impossible. And then this person would have, its own, would have their own emotional inflection, their own ideas, concepts about truth. So this person then starts to have certain beliefs um, modifying what was channeled. And so the end book, if you like, so if we look at it as a book with written words, uh, written down in the end, that end product is going to be a combination of a whole series of erroneous beliefs right from the beginning, along with some ideas that these people have found at this level to be truth. It'll be a mixture. And the problem we have on earth is determining which bit was right and which bit was wrong. Right? And that's always going to be our difficulty. Now, if we analyse it through the qualities of truth, what are the qualities of God's truth, we'll eventually determine what is right and what is wrong. Um, may I ask one more question before I pass on the mic? Sure. This is more on a personal level. But well, I can I, before you do, can yeah. I just say a bit more about these qualities of divine Absolutely. truth? Absolutely. Absolutely. Myself and Mary have just done a series of frequently asked questions about the qualities of divine truth. And we're just loading them up on the internet now. I just did a heap yesterday. And my suggestion to people is if you want to find out what is true, the better thing to do first is to find out what are the qualities or attributes of truth. You know, what, what will determine whether it's true or not first. Now, in these discussions that we've given, we've listed 14 different attributes and qualities. They're not, a limitation. They're not limited, you know, there's more than that. But there are 14 quite strong attributes and qualities of God's truth. And when you understand them, you will find truth very easy to find when it's presented to you. You will also find that the majority of things presented to you are not true <laughs> as a result of looking at those qualities and comparing what you hear with those qualities. So if somebody comes up to you and says, look, I'm telling you the truth. You've got to do this, and if you don't do this, you're going to end up in hell, right, if you don't do something. Now, there might be some truth in what they're saying. You don't know at that point, right? But if you look down the qualities of divine truth and ask yourself, well, does that meet this quality? Does that meet that quality? Is this, you know, and you compare it with the qualities you will find that there are certain things you could discard in that statement, but certain things that might be true in that one statement. And then if somebody says to you, look, something like they present a belief system to you. So many Christians will present a belief system to you that says something like this. If you don't believe in Jesus' blood, you are going to be in hell for the rest of your existence after you pass. You've got to accept the blood of Jesus to be saved. All right? Now, around 70%, I think it is, of your country claim to be Christian of that faith. So that means 70%, whether they are militant about it or 
or generalized about it, 70% basically have that concept about what saves you. If you look at the qualities of divine truth and compare it with that statement, you will find the statement itself cannot be true. Right? And it's just a matter of comparing it with the qualities of divine truth to find out whether certain statements can be true or can't be true. So my suggestion is have a look at those qualities. Um, they're listed on the Frequently Asked Questions channel. At the moment, I think I've got, I think I've got the first seven listed on the, on the channel. And it would be very helpful for you to be able to find out how do you, when you hear things and when you engage processes, how do you know it's true or not? It's a, and this will help you a lot in determining how you know it's true. Does that make sense? Yep. Fire away with your okay. personal. <clears throat> so I have heard you mention that and there's been many cases where you've shared with individuals their biggest block to receiving divine love and divine truth. Mm -hmm. And fast forward four, five, six years later, they still haven't addressed that issue. Um, and perhaps it'd be valuable for you to maybe uh, talk about that a little bit. But also, I would love for you, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me what you feel is my biggest block <laughs> to receiving more divine love and divine truth so that I can do my best in <laughs> moving forward and progressing. Sure. Um, probably I'd like to answer your question a little generally first. So should we do that? The biggest blocks associated with receiving divine love are five blocks primarily. And they're related to the five core things that I've tried to share with people, particularly over the last few months. And the putting it to together discussion that uh, I think is on the YouTube now. Um, outlines those five things and um, just can you remember what they are if for those of you who have looked at it so truth, truth humility love faith and will okay so let's put them in the order that i feel we need to engage them <laughs> shall we faith will Humility, truth, and love. Okay, why do you reckon I've used that order? <laughs> Can you see? Well, firstly, if you don't have any faith at all, it's highly unlikely you will use your will to be humble, receive some truth, and want to be more loving. Does that make sense? So, so somehow there's going to have to be some faith starting the process. Start, start, and, and it's not faith in me or any other person. It's faith that God exists, that God has love to give you. Some very basic concepts about God, in fact, that we need to have faith about. That God's created a universe that's loving and some very basic principles like that. If we don't have that underlying faith in God's nature... It is highly unlikely we will ever engage wanting to know more about God or wanting to receive love from God. So if you believe, for example, if you believe that God is a punishing God, would you like to receive love from a punishing God? Well, some people do want to do that. But I'd say if I felt that God was a punishing God, I definitely wouldn't want to receive anything from that God. I'd be too worried about God punishing me for whatever I received, right? So that, that, would, that would cause a lot of problems. So unless we have faith in God's nature, it's highly unlikely that we will use our will, our free will that God's given us as a gift, to engage a process to connect to God. Now, let's say we do have faith. So we do believe at least that God's got some love to give us, let's say, and that God exists. Now, initially, for many of us, we don't even believe those two things, right? So, so a lot of the emotions that we need to work through first are dealing with the fact that we don't even believe that yet. Don't even believe that God exists or that God's got love to give us. Or many of us believe that we, God might have love to give other people, but not us. Uh, we have this sometimes this feeling that we don't deserve God's love as well. And that's going to also impact upon our will. Because it's highly unlikely you will ask for love if you feel before you start that you don't deserve it. Can you see that? Yeah. 
But let's say you do eventually generate some faith inside of yourself where you feel that God's got some love to give, that God exists, and that you have the capacity, desire, and also knowledge that you have the worth to receive it. Right? Then the, it's highly likely then that you will start to engage your will. You will start to want to do things to open yourself to the reception of that love. In other words, the will is going to need to be engaged in harmony with the faith that you've generated within yourself. And faith is based upon facts. Right? Not, it's not based upon fictions or, or just imagination. It's based upon facts. And in fact, if it's without the basis of facts, it's not faith at all. It's just concepts or ideas. True faith is always based on facts. And facts, once we gather the facts, we eventually will engage our will to actually learn more and, and go through a process. That's what we eventually do. Now, once we engage our will, uh, if we use the microphone, so there's the microphone. Just, um, when you say faith, mm -hmm. I think of faith as no facts. Exactly, that's how most people think of faith. Most people believe faith means no facts. But can I illustrate the kind of faith we're going to need? Um, let's compare it with what the world's done with science for a moment. Right? So if you think about the scientific achievements we've made. In the 1960s they, and the 1950s, and it actually started in the 40s, the space program began, right? And then in the 1950s, it ramped up, and then it was a big, there was a big competition between your country and the Russian government, of course, trying to be the first people into space. Now, why did mankind take the risk to go into space? Because it is a risk, isn't it? Like, you've got to develop life support systems, and who knows, you might shoot somebody out there, and they never come back. If you do it wrong, that's certainly the case, right? Now, what caused them to believe that if you shot somebody out there, they would be able to get back? What caused them to believe that? Facts. They had gained facts about what? Gravity is one of the facts that they'd gained. What else? Okay, so they needed to know about what we live on, which is not just oxygen, but a mixture of... of they needed to know about how, the, how water is going to fluctuate and be used in space. They had to know propulsion. They had to understand space in the sense that it was a vacuum, that once you pointed somebody in a certain direction, you were going to go in that direction, except when gravity takes over. They had to know. Now, these are all facts that they had gained through previous scientific experiments. Is that not true? So they now had all these facts that caused them to have faith that they could shoot somebody up into the space, make them go around the moon and even land on the moon and then get back home and tell of their experience. But they didn't know that it would actually be achievable until they did it, but they believed with all of their heart because if they didn't believe with all their heart, they wouldn't have tried it. They believed with all their heart that because of what they knew about all of these facts, they could have the faith that shooting someone off into space meant, and getting them back was achievable. Does that make sense? Now that's exactly the same with our faith about God. That's the same kind of basis that we need to have. So we need to start experimenting with what is God's nature and characteristics and we need to develop enough knowledge or facts about that to actually generate enough faith that we can use our will to connect to God otherwise we'll never do it we'll never do it and so to me faith is always based on facts and I would never choose to connect to God unless I had good factual evidence that would suggest that it was worth trying does that make sense now, I know a lot of people on earth think about faith completely different to that. And, I, and I, I don't understand, actually, the way faith is achieved on earth for many people because 
they have faith in what I believe is no facts at all. And that, obviously, is not going to be very conducive to you using your will firmly in a certain direction. You have to... And this whole concept of blind faith, to me, is a complete oxymoron. It's a complete opposite of two terms. There's no such thing as being blind when you have faith, right? There's no such thing as that, in my opinion. What we need to do is base our faith upon the facts that we've discovered about the universe. And in this case, if we're developing a relationship with God, between ourselves and God, there's two parts in that. We need to know about God's nature and we need to know about our own. We need to know facts about our own nature and facts about God's nature before we're going to develop any faith to that such a connection between ourselves and God is possible. Does that make sense? So, I feel faith is based on facts. When it's based on facts, it is solid. It has a good foundation. Right? Once you've got a solid foundation to your faith, you will be motivated to use your will to discover things, to do more things, to move in some direction. But if you have no faith, it's highly unlikely you will motivate your will to discover new things in relationship with God. Highly unlikely. And so I find the majority of people struggle with these concepts because they are still struggling with the facts. Right? So whenever I am uncertain about something, and this still applies to me now, I always go back, what are the facts that I have already established and what are the things that I've yet to establish? But isn't it the uncertainty that makes you have faith? Um, I don't feel it's the uncertainty that makes you have faith. No, as I've pointed out here, I'm saying... That's just, that's not the that's a physical. If you're speaking to the mic... Oh, that's a physical thing. I'm talking about faith as faith. So am I. I'm talking about... That. See, I, what I find is very logical is that on one hand we do this with physical things, but we don't do it with spiritual things. And what I'm suggesting to you is we need to do this with spiritual things just as much as we do it with physical things. We need to be like scientists when it comes to spiritual things just as much as we are like scientists with physical things. That's what we need well, to do. If you have faith, you just know. You don't have to have proof. You know. I, I don't agree. There's no way you know. How can of you know? Of course you do. You know because you, you know. No, you don't. You've had no personal experience, so you don't know. I have personal experience. Well, that's when you know, but that's because of the gathering of some facts. If you've had a personal experience of something that is true, then you've gathered some facts. Okay. Then you can know. But before that, you can't know. It's only just in the It's not on the physical level. I agree, but what we do physically is the same as what we need to do spiritually. We need to gather the facts. The way we gather facts is a bit different, but we still need to gather the facts. Does that make sense? Yep. And if we go back to who was I? With yeah, Lamar. Now, the question you asked Lamar was more of a personal one. Like, what are my personal issues that I need to focus my life on? Now, these are what I feel you need to focus your life on, these particular things. Now, for many people, there is usually one or more of these things that is a problem. Right? And if I can illustrate some of that. Humility is a huge problem for humanity. Now, let's define humility the way I would like to define it. Humility is the desire and longing to experience every single emotion that you have within yourself without blaming anyone else for it and without harming anybody else with it but a complete, pure desire to, lo to love yourself and experience every single personal emotion. That's my definition of humility. And, number part two, parts of the second part of it is, to see yourself as God sees you, right now. Warts and all. Now, that's where I see there is a lot of problems with humanity. Most people on the earth have no desire or very little desire to feel and experience every single emotion inside of them. 
And most people have no desire to see themselves how God sees them. Right, so humility is a huge issue that most people face. And, and honestly, God is constantly trying to break down our arrogance and move us into humility. But the majority of us are very resistive to that process because we're very resistive to feeling all of our emotions, but also because we're very resistive to seeing anything that's a flaw within ourselves. So most of us prefer to look in the mirror and cover up ourselves. In fact, you ladies do it every day pretty much when you go to work or whatever. You know, put on the makeup. That's seeing the flaws and covering them over in order to present something different to the world, right? Now, most of us do that emotionally all the time. Men and women do that emotionally all the time. And that's because we lack humility. We do that. All right? So humility is a large issue for the majority of people on the planet. It's a big, big issue. The way in which we use our will is also a very large issue for most people on the planet. The majority of people use their will in a very selfish manner. In other words, we become very self-absorbed in our life. Our life becomes self-centric, I suppose you could say. And that's understandable given the fact that we have our own feelings and our own belief systems and so forth. But we become so self-centric or self-centred that we can't see when we're treating other people in the manner that is not how we would like them to treat us. Right? We can't even see it. And remember that discussion the other night, we had a few people around the other night, and I was pointing out how even just going out to a restaurant, we're often expecting the, the staff, waiting staff, to treat us in a way that we wouldn't like to have, be treated, or we treat our waiting staff in a way that we wouldn't like to be treated ourselves. And we often do these things. And so the way in which we use our will is a very important learning lesson we need to understand. And, and that is, God. part of the reason why God put us on this planet was for us to learn how to use our will in a loving manner at all times, no matter what the response. That's one of the reasons why we're here, to learn how to use our will in harmony with love, no matter what are the rewards of doing so. Now, it's the no matter what are the rewards of doing so that most people have the problem. We're okay being loving when there's rewards, but when somebody gets angry with us, we're no longer okay with being loving. Right? Or when somebody seems to treat us badly, we're no longer okay with being loving then. So how we use our will is going to have a huge effect on whether we're going to grow truly from a soul-based spirituality. Most people are also not willing to address the holes in their faith. You know how you have doubts? You know? Most people are not willing to actually admit their doubts. Even. Because doubts cause confusion. And what do most people feel about confusion? That it's not a very nice place to be. Confused. We don't like being confused. So what do we prefer to do? Tell ourselves that we're not confused, even though we have no real faith or proof of our faith. So faith is, is also going to be a major area to develop. Now, can you see these three things are going to firstly need to be developed before we even have a desire for that? And what I find on the planet is that most people have a fear of that. Most people are afraid of truth. They're not afraid of external truth so much. In other words, they're not afraid of what is the truth of the universe. They're afraid of what is the truth about themselves. Most people are terribly afraid of that. And that's where most people's resistance builds. We resist hearing the truth about ourselves. And as a result, we're sort of walking around in the world trying to stay blind to the truth about ourselves while at the same time trying to have our eyes open looking at the truth about other things. And then, of course, you finish up walking around like this, of course. You're like, what you're doing is you're only opening your eyes when there's no emotional response to the truth you're receiving. 
Now, you can't receive much truth that way. That's the fact. And yet, most of us are in terrible resistance to truth. And that's before we even get to the biggest thing that we need to learn, <laughs> which, is that, which is what is love? What, how does love feel like? What does it feel like in terms of expressing it, receiving it? What is real love from God's perspective in comparison to what is love from an earth-based or human perspective? What, what is love and what, how, do, how, do, how do we transmit it? How do we receive it? All of these questions, most of whom most of us can't even answer those questions because we've yet to engage these particular things. We think we know what love is. We think we know. That's a part of our arrogance, the opposite to humility. We think we know. But it's only by engaging these qualities and actually rece receiving some love from God that we actually, in the end, know. In this sense, if we come across here, because I was still answering Lamar's question in all of this. Uh, if you wait for the mic, just uh, it's going to come to you. Thank you. So this is pertaining to Will. I'm kind of sensing that you have a very different definition than I do, and yeah. I'm kind of going through that where I've really moved away from the ego, and I feel like, what is my will? And I think I can see that I need to align it with faith, so this is great, but I'd, I'd love to hear your definition of what Can I ask is. you what yours is? Well, I knew what it used to be. It was right. very connected to my ego and, and who so I when you perceived say your myself ego, to be. Yeah, is that what you mean, ego, to mean? Yes, yeah. like who I thought I wanted to be in the world and my emotions. And when I let go of everything, I feel like I'm in a blissful state, but I have no will. So now I'm saying I need to align it with God. But I feel yeah. when I look at that, I don't know what it means. True will. bliss is not possible without will, actually. So, so a lot of people believe in the New Age teachings, they believe that they can release a desire to do anything, and in the end they'll be at one with everything. That's not the case at all, actually. And in fact, it's the opposite of what God wants us to do. It's a very uh, intellectual way of examining true loving, a true loving condition. And I, and I can explain some of that in a minute. What you're defining as ego, see, ego historically has def been defined differently. In the, in the early stages of the development of our language, ego actually meant your nature or your character. Does that make sense? Um, and, it, and it's only come to mean dirty things, you know, like ego is not a dirty word, you know, that skyhooks. Have you ever heard skyhooks? They're an Australian band. So You've you got to educate yourself. There's this song that goes, ego is not a dirty word. Um, because it, actually the word ego began from this, from this concept of your individual personality and nature. Does that make sense? So from God's perspective, your ego is your individual personality and nature. Um, in other words, what God created you to be is your ego from God's perspective. But that's not now what the word means for most people. What the word means for most people is that most people do believe it means it's a dirty thing. <laughs> ego is a dirty word. And for most people now, it means their facade. You know, what they created as the image of themselves to be rather than what God created them to be. That's what most people believe it to be, the word ego. Now, if we make the assumption that that's what ego is, that this facade-based person, then obviously, yes, you're going to need to deconstruct the facade. So there are really, if you can think about it, three selves. There's this facade self, right? And then I would say to you that there's also the injured self, which we created the facade to avoid. Right? Now, often this facade was created not through just our own process, but also through the processes of our parents. You know, they wanted a certain facade. So if you look at it in any society, generally our children grow up to a large extent to be mirror images of ourselves in terms of our belief systems and so forth because we want them to engage certain facades and not have other things that we think are, you know, that we, we have no love of. And that's to cover our injured self. That, that's the self we're trying to not feel when we create the facade or what you would probably have called before your ego, right? But there is the third self, which is the original self that God created. And that original self 
is the person that we need to become. Well, it's, it's better to say we're already it, but with a lot of injuries and a lot of facade on top. Does that make sense? It's sort of like you can think of it as a layer. Where there's our original self, and what we've done is over the course of our life, right from the time of, from the time of conception onwards even, there's been a lot of damage uh, you know, associated. So that's like mud that's been thrown at this pure ball, if you like, which is our original self. And then what we did, because of all this mud being quite painful and we, we don't want to recognise a lot of it, we created another layer on top, which is our facade, our well, ego. And that facade is allowing us to walk around in the world in complete ignorance of the injuries most of the time, and certainly in complete ignorance of what God originally created us to be. Now, what God originally created us to be is our true personality and nature. And what God wants us to do, part of what God wants us to do, is to use our will to not only rediscover it, but also then to live in it. And that means that we're going to have to have desires. We're going to have to have, to have passions. The only reason why those desires and passions that we might currently have are painful is because we don't get them fulfilled. And the only reason why they're not fulfilled is because in God's universe, God's universe will not fulfill any desire that's out of harmony with God's definition of love. Does everyone get that? That's a very important statement I just made. <laughs> and very important to understand. God will not fulfill your desires in the universe unless your desires are completely in harmony with love right that's the if if you do my will you will receive and and there's a big if right and i'm not talking about my will that's the that's really what god's saying to us if you do my will if you do in other words what are the laws regarding love if you do what's loving you will receive. If you're not receiving, then it's because whatever is your will is being exercised out of harmony with love. Now, this original self isn't automatically loving. God created it to have the potential to be loving, but God also created it to have the potential that you could develop yourself into a very unloving person if you wanted to. And there are many people on the earth who want to. Right? So we're going to have to use our will even to want to love rather than want to do damaging things to other people. Does that make sense? Now, if we understand that the facade, or what you refer to in the past as the ego, is not the real self, but rather one of these layers around the real self, and the injuries are not even the real self, they're the layers, that's the, this layer around the real self that people, that you lived in a world, and that world imposed a lot of its injuries upon you. Right? That also will need to disappear before you're going to discover your original self. And God wants you to discover your original self. So if you're resistive to getting, letting go of the facade, or you're resistive to letting go of your injuries you will never become the self that God created you to be. Now, once that original self is discovered, we have the ability to make it grow, to become larger. Right? And that's also developed by our will to receive God's love. So as God's love pours into the soul, the human soul, the soul expands beyond its original capacity to understand its original capacity to love and everything. It expands beyond that. Its original capacity to understand truth expands beyond that as we receive God's love. But, but it's only our original, real, and I've used the term before, real self, right? the real person you are, that can connect to God. This injured self will struggle connecting to God because of all of our injuries. And the facade cells has zero connections with God, actually, no matter how much it claims opposite. So there are many people who are in a faith, for example, on earth, who are completely in their facade, and yet when you boil it all down, you know, they're willing to go to war and hurt somebody else. They're willing to do all sorts of things in their religion, in their religious faith. Well, that's all facade. None of that's connecting to God. And it's only by going into their inner self and working out why they're so injured and then going into their original self that they'll actually ever connect to God. 
That makes sense? Now, the reason why I raise all that is because our will or our free will, which is a gift that God gave to you as an individual and to every other person who's ever existed, this gift is a very beautiful gift. But you need to know how to use it because it's like a knife. All right? You use a knife in the wrong way, and what's the result? There's a lot of injuries and potential death. Right? And it's the same when we use our soul's will in the wrong direction. There is the potential for lots of harm to ourselves and to other people. And so how we use our will, our motivation and force that we have ourselves in terms of our personal power has to be brought into harmony with love before we're going to feel, fully feel the positive benefits of having free will. And all of God's laws of God's universe are there to try to help us see that every time we act out of harmony with God's laws of love, we are using our will to not only harm ourselves, but also harm others. And that's, I feel, what we need to learn about our ego, if you like. Now, God's definition of ego is that. <laughs> God created our real self, and that's how God sees the ego, as your real self. But for the majority of us, how we see our ego is that, our facade that we've created after years and years and years of imagining that we're somebody that we're not. Right? Now, breaking down that facade, breaking down the ego, that's going to be hard work because there's the layer of facade to break off. And remember, the layer of facade was created because we wanted to avoid the injuries. And most people don't want to feel how much they are injured. Right? And so they always want to revert back to the facade. So every time we start trying to get into our injuries, there's this underlying thing going, don't go there, don't go there, you know, stay away from that. And that moves us back into the facade every single time. And what we need to do is get beyond both the facade and the injuries, and then we can discover our real self. But to get beyond it, it's not an intellectual process. It's not a process of numbing out to everything. It's a process of becoming super sensitive to everything. So sensitive that you become sensitive to receiving God's love. And God's love will transform your soul back to its original nature, if you can receive it. All right? And there's another big if. If you can receive it, God's love will transform your soul. The key is, how do I receive it? All right? That's the real key question that we need to ask. But you can see that this process, you could choose to do yourself without God even, couldn't you? You could choose to break down your facade. You could choose then to feel your injured self. A lot of people in New Age circles notice they have a facade. And then what they decide to do, instead of going through their injured self, which is all about experiencing right, the negative emotions that are inside of the injured self, so that they can be released, instead of choosing to do that, most people get to about there and put a wall up and call that bliss. And that's what happens with almost every new age spirituality that I've ever examined. They try to think they've developed and think they're all blissed out, but as soon as you press one of their buttons, bang, they're back into either facade or yelling, screaming, they're in their injured self. Does that make sense? And that's an indication that the real injuries have yet to be released. Right? And if you've got to meditate for four hours a day to maintain that state, then it's not a real state. The reality is when you have, when you have cleared away the injured self, you will not have to meditate for one minute a day. You will be naturally loving in all circumstances, in all situations, and feel naturally calm in all circumstances and all situations without having to meditate a single moment of the day. Does that make sense? You won't have to engage yourself in a practice. The engagement of a practice is usually done to avoid the injury. Right? And if you examine, many of you have been involved in New Age type spiritual pursuits in the past... You, when you look back on those particular pursuits, you can see that a lot of the times you engage the process to avoid something. Right? 
rather than engaging the process to, to actually feel it. Right? And it's only through the feeling of emotion that you can release it. Now, I can give you an example of that, which is a real example, and that is any child, you notice when any child falls over, it has this initial reaction of feeling the pain, having a big cry, and then sometimes if you've let them have the cry properly, five minutes later, what are they doing? Exactly the same thing again. A lot of the times, like, they don't, there's no fear in them whatsoever about what happened. All right? Now, how did they get from that space, the place of like, feeling the pain and then going through the pain and then out the other side? They did it by experiencing the emotion. Now, what we learn to do, and we're often taught to do this, is we're taught to not experience the emotion. All right? Now, in the process of not experiencing the emotion, we can fool ourselves into thinking it no longer exists, but the reality is it gets stored into our injured experience. Your soul is like a great big storage container, storing another one, storing another one, storing another one, and every emotion you don't actually feel and release will be stored. Now, for most of us in our childhood, that means we had a lot stored because our parents many, very often shut down the experience of most emotions. So our injured self builds over our lifetime, builds, 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 into such a point that we get to the point almost where we can't even control it anymore, that how much is stored, like it just starts spilling out. And this is why, you know, oftentimes the older we get, the grumpier we get. Because our injured self is now just spilling out all the time. We can't, it's so much stored in there, some of it's got to come out sometime. So, you know, it starts coming out. And, uh, and when a person passes frequently, it just starts coming out quite, quite a lot, like where their injured self is quite, quite obvious. And the fact that your body is decaying is a sign about your injured self still having dominance. So the reality is if our bodies were... Uh, if our injured self didn't have dominance and we were in our original self, none of us would age beyond 25. All right? None of us would get fat. None of us would put on weight. None of us would get so thin that we're ema you know, emaciated. None of those things would occur. Because God created the real self to have complete control in love over both bodies, the spiritual and physical bodies. So, so, so the fact that we're even ageing is, is an indication that we're not allowing ourselves to feel some of our injured self. Does that make sense? So I meet very many people who are quite aged who say, oh yes, I know this and I know that and I know this and I know that. I'm going, I'm sorry, you don't know all those things. Because if you knew all of those things, you wouldn't look 90 you would look 25, right? You, that's how you would look. So it's just a facade that you've got going on, thinking that you know all of these things, an intellectual process. Once you fully engage the truth from God's perspective, what you'll do is you'll go through the injured self, and as a result of letting go the causes of all of our body issues and pains and su suffering and so forth, you'll get to your real self, and as that occurs, different things in your system, your body system, physically, emotionally, will all be cured. And they'll be cured permanently. And you'll get to the point eventually, whether it's on earth or in the spirit world, you'll get to the point eventually, if you engage the process, where you start engaging your real self at one with God and you feel young, vibrant, and you'll always have your will engaged. You, it will not be a numbing of your desires all of your desires will be explosive in their nature, but they'll all be in harmony with God's love, all of them. So God wants us all to learn how to use or have all of our desires, but have them all in harmony with love. So it's not a process of tuning out of desire, it's a process of understanding your desires. Initially, many of our desires are driven by our facade or our injuries, but we release so all of those things and eventually we get to the stage where all of our desires are in complete harmony with God's love. Then there's, no thing, no, there's nothing to be afraid of, is there, in that place because you're never going to act out of harmony with love once you're in that place 
and also your physical form and your spiritual body and all those things will be perfectly in alignment. You won't have to go and get any therapy of any kind. You won't have to go to a doctor ever. You won't have injuries after injuries occurring. You won't have accidents even, actually. No one, no one in the celestial spheres has a single accident. Right? So if they were living on Earth, they'd be driving a car, never have an accident. <laughs> right? And they might not be driving a car, of course, either. But uh, they'll never have an accident. And that's the beauty of the universe God's created us. Now, obviously, at the start of the process, we don't have faith in any of what, of what I've just said, generally. And this is why we need to start building one upon the other. Yeah. Does that help answer your question? Excellent. Yeah. Very comprehensive answer. Oh, yes. <laughs> <Taking it all laughs> in. So that's what I feel the majority of us need to do. So if we get back to the last question, which is about the personal things that we can do, you can see that firstly, one of the most important things to learn is how to be self-reflective. Can you see that? Because if, if you're not self-reflective, you need somebody else. You're dependent upon somebody else to tell you what's going on with your life. So one of the very best things we can learn to do is become more and more self-reflective. And to be self-reflective is actually an attribute of humility. I don't know if you've noticed, but the majority of people who look in particularly in, in like uh, spiritual circles, and it doesn't matter whether the spiritual circle is a religious type of thing, like a Christian faith or a Muslim faith or some other faith like that, or some kind of spirituality that's involved in new age type of pursuits, most people generally avoid self-reflection. They're not good at seeing themselves. They're often quite good at seeing everyone else. We, 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 team, we team, seem to have a very good feel generally, or many of the times, about what everybody else is doing wrong. But when it comes to ourselves, we are often very limited. Now, that is because generally we have developed this state of arrogance, arrogance rather than humility. And what we've come to, to do is we've come to believe that our own perception of ourselves is correct. You know, we believe our own Facebook page. <laughs> In other words, we believe our own advertising <laughs> about ourselves, right? And, and oftentimes we, we don't see ourselves as God sees us. And in fact, many of us often have no desire to either, if we're honest with ourselves. We, we want to maintain a certain impression of ourselves that we also give to the world and we have no desire to do it any differently many times. Now, what I feel is one of the main problems most people face in their, in their progression towards God is this problem of self-reflection. I find there's very little of it. And we do one of two things in our arrogance. We do one of two things. Do you, any idea what you might do um, generally, if you have no self-reflection. Like, can I give you some suggestions with it? One thing is we look for a leader. A leader. What does that help us do? That means that we don't have to be self-reflective. We just go up to him and ask him what his opinion is. And he tells us... Da -da 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 -da. And we go, oh, okay, okay. We believe some of it, maybe. And then we try to put that into practice, right? I see a big problem with that. It's a big problem with that. Because in the end, that person, no matter who he is, and he could be the most developed person in the universe, that person still is going to have their own opinion. And he's allowed to have, by the way, from God's perspective, his own opinion. And by you wanting his input... All you're doing is making yourself reliant upon him or her. That's all you're doing. You're creating dependency. Does that make sense? And why do we do that? We do that because we don't want to go through the personal experience of making mistakes, which is actually a condition of arrogance that causes us to do that. We don't want other people to see, see, you made a mistake, there's another mistake, oh, there's another mistake, and point the finger at us, and because we avoid those particular emotions, we want to go to somebody, he tells us what to do, we go and dutifully do that, 
And then when somebody points out we've made a mistake, no, I didn't. That person told me to do all that. We, we want somebody to be responsible for our choices and decisions. That's why we look for leaders. You know, looking for leaders creates cults, which then creates religions, which also creates politics, which also creates economic conditions, and so forth and so forth. And we can, you could list almost everything that nowadays many of us feel the negative in the world we have around us. And it all comes because we are unwilling to go through our own personal mistakes and we want somebody else to rescue us from the potential of making any mistake. All right? That's one of the things we do. We look for a leader. The other thing we have a tendency to do is say to ourselves that everything is okay. <laughs> look at myself in the mirror. Yeah, he's beautiful. Don't worry about him. Everything's okay. <laughs> All right? And the reason why we do this is because it helps us avoid the feelings that we really have. So we love to do that. Now, what happens when we tell ourselves everything is okay? What's the next thing that happens after we tell ourselves everything's okay? We start saying that everything's okay with the world. Or we say that all of our problems are the world. Not okay world. One or the other. We then create spiritual belief systems that tell us one of these two things in avoidance of the fact that we're not okay. And again, we could trace a lot of the creations right the way through to our economic system, our religious systems and so forth. Now, these are all because we want to avoid self-reflection. All of these things are happening. We want to avoid what's going on within ourselves. We want to avoid seeing ourselves as we truly are. Right? It's much better to not search for a leader. So Lamar, it's much better that you don't ask me what's wrong with you. <laughs> Does that make sense? What's better is to become more humble and be self-reflective. This is what I've had to do in my life. I have not relied on other people to tell me what's wrong with me. And in fact, many people would still come up and tell me what's wrong with me and I know they're wrong. <laughs> and then some people come up and tell me what's right with me and I go, no, that's actually wrong with me. <laughs> that's something wrong with me. <laughs> still, you know. So, so we need to be self-reflective and allow ourselves to see our, ourselves as God sees us. That's what we need to do. In other words, what I need to do is know what God feels about me and what God sees in me. And a lot of people then assume that God only sees good things in you. If you think that, you, think, you obviously think God's pretty dumb because God sees everything, <laughs> not just good things in you. Right? The reality is God sees us exactly as we are, our original self, our injuries, our injuries and our facade, everything. Right? And God's laws are all trying to expose to us at every single moment what we are. So you've heard of the law of attraction, yes? You know, and I'm not talking about some new age concept of this law. I'm talking about this law that God created that is actually demonstrating to us at every single moment of our existence. Even when you're asleep, you're in the spirit world having experiences. You're having your sleep state experiences. And even there, this law is still in that operation, trying to show you what you are right now. And that what you are is not just your real self, but it's also with your injuries and your facade. And God's law is trying to show you what you are. And there's another law called the law of cause and effect. And that's trying to show you what you create. Right? It's trying to show you what you create. It's trying to show you the relationship between what you've created and why you created it. 
Then there's another law called the law of compensation. And that law is giving you pain to show you a feedback system to show you that you've done things that are out of harmony with love. That's what that law's for. So every time you feel any pain at all, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever pain is, the pain is an indication that there is some compensatory thing going on for a previous choice or decision that has been made. And the key for you is to want to know what it is. All right? Now I could list more laws, and every one of them are laws of love that God is trying to, God is, has created so that you, personally, without assistance from anyone else, can actually see everything about yourself. And all I'm trying to share with you is how to do that. Does that make sense? So I don't want to share, I don't want you to do what I tell you to do. What I want you to do is to know how you can engage this process with God so that you can sort everything out for yourself. In other words, you become self, like what I would call self responsible individuals. That's what God wants you to become. A complete self-responsible individual. So this is very, very important. So in answer to the Mars question, basically what I feel needs to occur is rather than asking, and, and you're allowed to ask anything in these seminars, by the way, including about yourself, but rather than asking questions about what is my single biggest injury, my feeling is, what do you think your single biggest injury is? Number one. Number two, are you doing something about that every single day to fix it? Or are you just putting it on the back burner all the time, you know, putting it aside, putting it aside, putting it aside, not dealing with it? Right. What are you doing? Do you, are you, do you have a will to even address the issue? And if you have no will to address the issue, what are you doing to fix that? Do you see? These are the kinds of questions that I ask myself every single day. And to me, these are the kind of questions that need to be asked of every, by every single person every single day. So if we have a microphone over here. I was wondering if you could address how you can participate in this process if your profession... In your profession, you are in a role of leadership. How can you do the faith, will, humility, have truth, and love while being in a position of leadership? Well, it's no different to me being in a position of leadership or being in any other position. Um, I feel that a lot of the times we avoid doing these things because we are afraid. So, and this is what I discussed a lot in this discussion that I gave about you know, putting it all together. The biggest single problem we have of doing all of these things is fear. And most of us have no idea of how afraid we actually are. And the more addictions there are in a society, the more afraid we are. So the reality is your society is a very addicted society, not just physically, but also very much emotionally, just like most Western nations are. And that means that there is a huge amount of fear that you're not facing individually and collectively. Now, it's your fear that prevents you from thinking that you can engage these whether you're a leader or not. It makes no difference if you're a leader or you're not a leader. You can engage all of these things every time. So, for example, if you're a leader, many people who are leaders like being in a place where they can tell other people what to do. That's reality, right? If you're a true leader, you're not telling other people what to do, you're telling them how to discover what to do for themselves, which is a very, very different desire, right? So you're not asking people to do what you want, you're asking them to do what they want, but bring what they want into harmony with love. Now, as a leader, you have a great capacity to demonstrate that, firstly, by your own example, right? And then secondly, by what you teach to others. All right? So, um, if I can give you some maybe personal examples about that. Um, if a person comes up to me and says, AJ, what should I do? I'm in this particular situation. 
The first thing I say to them, look, I can't tell you what to do. You have your life. You are a complete self-responsible individual from God's perspective. You have to make the choice about what you can do. Oh, I can't do that for you. That's number one. Secondly, I then say, but if I was in your position, these are the things I would consider. I would consider, what would love want me to do? If I was into telling the truth in all times, what would the truth demands I do? If I was humble, what would my humility want me to do? And would I just sit there, you know, all afraid of doing it? No, I would exercise my will to do it. No matter how much everyone around me disagrees with what I'm doing. Or no matter how much everyone around me wants to condemn me or maybe even kill me for what I'm doing. If I'm in harmony with love, I will still do it. It doesn't matter if I lose my job, lose my house, lose my family, lose my friends, lose my life. I will do it because I want to love and I want to do all of these things if I really want them. So can you see, you have great capacity, whether you're a leader or not, to demonstrate leadership through this process of your own example, engaging these things for yourself firstly, and then teaching other people how to engage these things for themselves, rather than telling them what to do. Now, if you look at most, you know, I would say most organisations on this planet, the leaders tell other people what to do. And initially, when we engage things this way, there would be pandemonium and total confusion on this planet. Because the majority of people don't want to love, don't want to tell the truth, don't want to be humble, don't want to use their will in harmony with all those things. They want to be told what to do so they don't have to take responsibility for their life. And when you try to make them responsible for their life, it takes many years sometimes for them to actually engage that process. So I've been teaching principles of divine truth uh, from in a public manner for the last 10 years. For the first five years, hardly a single person engaged any of the principles I taught them. Because the way I teach is that a person has to engage their own will. I can't force them, I can't make them, I can't sit here and be like some kind of uh, Anthony Robbins type of person who just jeez you all up and makes you go away feeling good about yourselves. <laughs> And, and good about your facade, in other words. And I can't do that either. All I can do is present truth to you, show you the way to God, and then leave it up to you. That's all I can do. Now, because that's all I can do, the changes come slowly. And the reason why they come slowly is because everyone else who hears will have to sincerely engage their will at some point for it to change. But once they do, the change is real. It's a firm foundation. Does that make sense? And so the changes that actually happen inside of the soul of the individuals are driven by themselves. And that is the most powerful driving force that any person can engage in their life, your own desires and passions driven by yourself. Because if somebody else is driving you, it means that you don't want to drive yourself. And what I'm trying to do is encourage every person to number one, drive themselves, drive their own life. But number two, drive it in harmony with love. That's what we're trying to so do. So rather than lead others, you're more facilitating them leading themselves. Yes, you could say that the way I'm, the le the way I'm a leader, and, and God did place me in a position to be so, is only by my example and by what I teach. It's not by me telling you what to do. You see, leadership on this planet is, is very much the opposite of what's done in the celestial realms of the spirit world. Leadership on this planet is getting a whole group of people together, most of whom don't want to do what you want, <laughs> and then you convince them to do what you want by giving some money or some other kind of reward, and eventually they finish up doing what you want, and the ones that don't do what you want, you sack them and you get another group who are willing to do what you want. That's how you lead. Isn't that the average leadership? And, that pre if, if, and that's the average leadership even in a religion, if you think about it. The majority of religions are exactly the same way, except they say that what they want is what God wants. There's the only difference, really. So they say, oh, this is what God wants you to do. I'm going to enforce that. And if you don't believe all that, I'm going to kick you out and get somebody in here who does. 
And, uh, and that's the way, in the same way, it's exactly the same way. Well, that's not leadership in God's eyes. Leadership in God's eyes is through your own positive example, demonstrate these qualities and then teach other people how to demonstrate these qualities. It seems like the, the, um, the quality of leadership can be often confused with the arrogance that you talked about. Of course. And the, um, the facade. Of course. Most leaders are, in fact, in a complete facade because they're mostly in addiction. The reason why they've established themselves as a leader is because they want glory, attention, approval, acceptance, all these different emotions that they're looking for. A true leader doesn't look for any of those emotions. So a true leader is able to lead when nobody else is following. <laughs> Does that make sense? A true leader is not dependent upon other people's opinions of him or herself. Right? All she or he cares about is God's opinion of himself or herself. That's all he or she cares about. If we use the microphone, and please don't yell out, put up your hand, if that's okay. And no, I can't answer you now. I just need you to think about what I've just said as the reason why it's not loving. But can I just continue addressing? So it's very important to understand this these important facts about what, what establishes you as a leader and what does not, from God's perspective. Now, from human perspective, it's totally different. I agree. From a human perspective, leaders basically are, as I've described, they are people generally who are addicted to approval, acceptance and so forth, wanting to control, and as a result, they establish a regime of some kind, usually it's a business or some kind of religion or some kind of cult or other kind of force, whether it be economic or political, they establish these kind of parties, political systems, religions and so forth, and then they try to enforce their will upon the group of people. That's what they intend to do generally, and that's how they demonstrate that they are a leader most of the time. Now, there are some people who don't do that, but the majority are like that. A true leader, though, is going to be like this. Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. Do you want to ask the question now? <laughs> So a true leader is a leader with nothing to gain. Exactly. That's exactly right. They lead for something good. It yes, they, out of it. they have Not higher ideals than gain. just their own interests. Agreed. Yes. yes. Can you give an example of this whole, um, what you go through to get to the inner? Sure. Can I ask first whether anyone has some questions about what I was just discussing before we move on? Subject? Was there another question associated? So Frank had some up. Uh, sorry, um, there's one lady here who had it too. Sorry, I've mixed up microphones. Okay, so. uh, I think this per pertains. Is I, I hearing you at all? Is it? If you just hold it up close. All right. Yeah, that's good. Which mic are you? What number? What number was the quiet one? Oh. It's got handheld. On it. It's got a enabled on it. Handheld one or handheld two. The one I have now is zero. One I had is zero, and the one was light. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've heard the word addiction a bit today. Yes. I've heard it in some of the past lectures too. Yes. Uh, could you give us a little uh, definition of addiction and maybe an example? Sure. Um, most of you understand addiction from a, um, from a physical perspective, don't you? Like, so would you, would you agree? Like, uh, for example, if I can give an example. I want to leave the word fear there because we want to discuss more about fear. So let's look at addiction. Okay, so physical addiction, what comes to mind? Drugs. Alcohol, smoking, food, food, gambling, sex, okay, anything else physically come to mind? Exercise, that's good. Okay. Meditation. Meditation, yes. yes. Uh, many new age people would be upset with me saying that meditation <laughs> is a, an addiction, but it actually is. 
watching videos. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an addiction too. Watching DT videos is even an addiction, yeah, I agree. Uh, and so we could list quite a few here, right? So there, there are physical addictions that we are aware of. What's the general nature of a physical addiction? What's the feeling in a person when they feel a physical addiction? If we have the mic over there, is there a... No, can I just... I want to have the... I feel that it's any time you're not engaged in those activities, that it's, um, it raises something in you that you don't want to experience. So you go back to the experience of the addiction. Excellent. So it's a compulsion to avoid something, isn't it? That's really what you're saying. So you feel compelled, as somebody yelled out, but, but, but in particular it's a compulsion to avoid a feeling of some kind, isn't it? That's what it is. So any person who goes to any addiction has a compulsion to avoid a certain experience. Okay, so let's rub all those out now. They're the physical ones. Okay, and uh, physical ones are easy, easy to see. Right? You can see when a person has a compulsion. Now, many of you are addicted to coffee, right? You know you are because you have a compulsion to get up with it every morning. And you can't give it up, can't give it up. Uh, I'd say half of America is probably addicted to coffee, isn't it? Yeah? No? Yes? Okay. I'm not telling you you have to stop drinking it. I'm just saying that it's an addiction. <laughs> you notice too, one of the things I'd like to point out, and this is something to be careful of in my seminars, I'll point out a truth to you, and a lot of people think it's a judgment. And there's a big difference between a judgment and a truth. I don't have a feeling towards you. If you want to drink coffee, you can drink as much as you want. Does that make sense? I'm just pointing out to you that it's an addiction. It's driven by some kind of compulsion to avoid some kind of emotion. One of the reasons why many of us do it right first thing in the morning is because we want to avoid just what happened when we were asleep in our sleep state. We want to avoid the memory of it. We want to avoid the feeling of it. We want to avoid the fear that we had coming back to the world. Even That's one of the reasons why many people do it first thing in the morning. That's why a lot of people, breakfast is a cigarette and a coffee. Two compulsions to avoid. <laughs> a whole group of emotions, right, that happened during the, when they were asleep. So the addiction is a compulsion to avoid an experience. And usually when we're talking about an experience, we're talking about an emotional experience. Okay? Now, why do we have a compulsion to avoid an experience? Isn't it only because there is a fear of the experience? Isn't it? So can you see, addictions are created to avoid fear about experiences. Now, let's look at it from an emotional perspective because that is a much more difficult way to examine our uh, compulsions. From an emotional perspective, most people are totally clueless about their addictions emotionally. They can barely see their physical addictions, let alone their emotional ones. And the emotional ones all are driven by quite large fears and fear prevents engagement of all of these things in a soul-based, pure desire in a passionate way. So can you see that addictions are going to be a major part, or addressing addictions are going to have to be a major part of looking at our fears. Our addictions tell us what our real fears are. Now when we don't get our addictions met, what do we do? Most of us get angry. And when, when, is your, when do you notice you're angry? For most people, they don't notice they're angry until they're actually very angry. <laughs> they don't notice that actually it began sometimes with even just a mild irritation. 
a mild annoyance, a mild, a very mild feeling of, oh, I don't just want, I don't want to be here type of feeling, a, mild, a feeling of disengagement. They don't realise that a lot of it's driven by anger, right? But so I would have to list under anger everything from rage to minor irritation. Right? And that's what I call angry. Every time we have an addiction that is not meant, we revert to anger. Every time we meet an addiction, our fear gets satiated, satisfied. In other words, it's not triggered, it's not exposed, it gets covered over. Yeah. And the only reason why we have these addictions are to avoid, and any time we want to avoid, it's an indication that we're afraid of something. All right. So, let's say we're in an environment like this. And I said, uh, one of you, in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to ask to come up and speak for five minutes. And if I was really serious about it, how many of you would instantly be triggered into fear? <laughs> right? Okay, a few of you. And does that mean Americans are more talkative than Australians? Probably does. Because in Australia, you would have had like three quarters of the audience put up there. And now what fear is it covering over? What fear is it that we are experiencing in that moment? Afraid of like, personal exposure, afraid of making mistakes. There's all sorts of fears, isn't there? Afraid that other people laugh at us, that they'll humiliate us, that I want to humiliate you in some way. And there's all sorts of fears that might get triggered in that one, just that one thing that I'm asking somebody to do. Now, most people then go into addictions to avoid those fears. So what would be an addiction to avoid a fear of public speaking? If we use the microphone, so put up your hand. Sorry, sometimes it's compelling to not put up your hand, but trying to teach our audiences to do that. Learn how to be an excellent public speaker as you are. Okay, so what we do is we go course after course after course after, and we have this exposure for months on end and months on end, and eventually, eventually we get that first gig, you know, and we do the first gig, and ah, you know, and then we do the next and the next, and eventually the fear dies down because we've engaged the process, yes. and a lot of that process is because we're avoiding the addictions, actually, isn't it? We're avoiding the addiction to having everybody like us, for example, you know. Most of us are not prepared to engage what we want to speak about right now. We want to get ourselves ready. And getting ourselves ready is about avoiding certain fears every single time. So that's what we do. We engage a process of education and learning many times. We do it to get it over it. What else do we do? For now, that's if we have to speak. What do the majority of us do? We avoid speaking at all in any public setting, don't we? we? Whenever we're in a group, where do we sit? As far away as possible from any person who's going to ask me to speak. Generally, that's what happens, right? If we had that particular addiction, that's what we would do. And we wouldn't confront it, generally. We would create a comfort zone. Isn't that what we do? Create a comfort-based life that prevents us from having to experience a lot of the things we're afraid of. So these addictions are about creating what we classify as personal comfort. That's why we do them. We, we do them because it's more comfortable to not have to be afraid than it is to feel afraid. But if we were truly humble, we would choose to feel our fear rather than doing this. And this is what we're facing. Now, with our emotional addictions, our emotional addictions, of course, are, are, are often much more intense than any physical addiction. And in fact, I prefer generally to deal with a person who's got a physical addiction um, because most of the time they know they've got one. But a person with an emotional addiction, they'll say, no, I don't. How dare you suggest such a thing? Or they'll go, 
ah, oh, is that really true? And they'll go off thinking, that's not true. <laughs> you know, trying to help a person come face, to, come face to face with their emotional addictions is often very difficult. And this is why we need to engage our own will to discover them rather than waiting or relying on somebody else to tell us what they are. We need to be prepared to see our own addictions. And, and unless you're prepared to see your own addictions, you will never expose your own fears. And trust me, you want to expose your own fears because if you don't expose your own fears, you'll never get to feel them. And if you never feel them, you'll never do any of these other really positive things because your fear will dominate your life. And if your fear dominates your life, you'll never be at one with God, ever. As long as your fear dominates your life, you will never be happy, you will never be joyful, you will never be loving, you will never be truthful even. You won't be humble. And then you'll convince yourself that it's all because you just don't have the faith. And really, for a lot of people, you know what it really is? They just don't want to feel their fear. So a lot of times, it, this fear dominates our very existence. It causes us to believe that we don't even have faith. It causes us to believe that we don't even have desires. Right? I see this happening in people's lives all the time. Like, I've sometimes had couples come up and they, you know, a lot of times people want some kind of counselling, which generally we don't give, right? <laughs> because we're always wanting people to focus on their own uh, lives and look at their own lives. But when they come up, they say... You know, we love each other a lot, but we never have sex. And I go, yeah, that's really strange, actually. That's really strange. And they say, but we feel it's okay. And I go, it's not okay. It's really strange. Because that's telling me, like, sexual desire is an inbuilt desire that God placed into your real self. If you're not feeling one, right and you're in a relationship that you say is loving, and you're not feeling that desire, there's got to be a lot of fear. There's got to be a lot of fear about sex. There's got to be a lot of fear about control. There's got to be a lot of fear about what, giving your heart, receiving somebody's heart, you know, all those kind of issues. There's got to be a lot of, involved with that if you're in a relationship and you feel pretty comfortable not having sex. Right? But most of them look at us like, that's not the answer that... I wanted to hear, you know. And so they walk away saying, he just got nothing, no idea what he's talking about, as usual. Uh, instead, if we were, if we, we need to notice one particular thing about fear. So fear suppresses, double P, sorry, yes. No, it's not one, double P, is it? Suppress, suppress. It suppresses will. Do you know what I mean by that? Every time you get afraid, you will convince yourself that you don't have a desire in a certain direction when you really do. Every time you get afraid, you will convince yourself that the desire is not present when it really is. Right. And so it's, it's imper uh, there is this imperative that we address fear as an emotion. It has to be addressed. But when we have addictions, getting back to Frank's question, we are actually choosing to avoid the fear. Therefore, we are choosing to suppress our will, which is an interesting concept, if you think about it. By living in our addictions, what we believe are our compulsions. In other words, what we believe our will is, is often what are our addictions. And they're actually being created in order to avoid the fear and suppress our true desire or will. Right. Now, if I can give you some examples of that with regard to this issue of sex. In, in Australia... There are many women who come along to our seminar. So if you have a look around in this seminar, you can see that the balance of men and women is pretty even, isn't it? This is very good, by the way. Because it's an indication that the, person, the information being presented to you is evenly balanced on the feminine and masculine side for a start. Right? But it also indicates that the people in the room 
have less injuries with regard to the opposition of the opposite gender and more of a generalised injury base. Does that make sense? So in other words, there's injuries about both genders more than injuries about one gender. Right? <laughs> That's a good sign. That's a, right? That's a good thing. Okay. Now, now, if you think about those kind of things and you go, okay, in Australia we ha sometimes have like two-thirds, three-quarters of a group being women coming along and most of them are single. And you know what they say to me about being single? They say they want to be. And I tell them they're liars. <laughs> and they tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> and that's about as far as it goes sometimes. The reality is, most of us do have a soul-based, inbuilt desire. In fact, God inbuilt inside of us, in our real self. So now I'm talking about the real self. I'll just rub out this side because we don't need that. We've got them in the right order now. In our real self, we are one half of a complete unit. So if, if this is me, my other half is op op the... No, it doesn't have to be the opposite gender. It's the opposite part of myself, the other part of myself. And the soul can be developed in this way or it could be in this way. Um, But there is another half of ourself, whatever the mixture is. There are the only three potential mixtures of how the soul is split. Now, if that's my real self, then what basically that's telling me is that God created me to share myself with the other half of myself, the other half of my real self. In other words, God created me to have a sexual interaction with the, my soul mate. That's God's creation, right? And if I'm avoiding that process, then I'm obviously shutting down a lot of fears. Right? What, would I, what kind of fears might I be shutting down? Well, it might be that I'm afraid that when I meet the other half of myself, that I won't like them. Which probably indicates that you don't like yourself very much as well. Right? Or I might feel that I meet the other half of myself and they'll dominate me. They'll control me. And I don't want that to happen, so I'm afraid of control. I'm afraid of being controlled. So I don't want to meet them. But in the process of not, meet, of not wanting these things, I'm afraid, and because I'm afraid, I exercise my will to not meet the other half of myself. In other words, I exercise my will to avoid the other half of myself. The very opposite of what God eventually wants us to be, how God eventually wants us to be happy, and in fact God created us to be such, is by engaging the other half of ourselves, not avoiding the other half of ourselves. Does that make sense? And obviously my fear turns off my desire to engage the other half of myself, and then I go around thinking, I don't need the other half of myself. I don't need men. I don't need a woman. When I say need, it's probably more, I don't want a man in my life. I don't want a woman in my life the other half of myself in my life and that's probably more honest because that's really what we're doing we don't want them there but we don't want them there not because of our true self but because of our fears and our fear is dominating and so we then exercise our addiction and in Australia what many people are, how many people are exercising their addiction is they, they live with another person of the same gender who they don't have any sexual relationship with so that they can avoid loneliness for example so they can avoid being alone. And they're afraid of the feeling of being alone, of course, until they meet the other half of themselves. And so what they do is they live with somebody else to avoid that feeling. And you'd be surprised how many times we make ta take actions and decisions based on avoidance. So we just start the back there. Hi. Um I'm happy you brought that up because I remember seeing that video and I had a, f a couple of questions and thoughts about it that I'd like to share. My first reaction was, um, around me I see a lot of people who always have to be in a relationship and yes. I, I see that that's kind of an addiction. Certainly it is. And my other thought was that um, I remember you saying that some people only meet their soulmates sometimes in the sixth dimension or 
much further on. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing also you saying that um, if you're with someone who's not your soulmate, you could be preventing yourself from actually meeting your soulmate. And so I wonder, like, isn't, aren't there a lot of people that they're just, they're not feeling it and they really want to be developing themselves until it just feels right? Yep. No, and this is the thing is that we often don't develop these things about relationships because we're terrified. And these terrors get reflected in people's questions frequently and also in media statements or attack of, my, of the teachings that I'm trying to teach. So in Australia, one of the biggest attacks that we get from the media is that we break up families. Right? Well, I've never broken up a family in my entire life. It's impossible for me to break up a family when I don't tell anybody what to do <laughs> for a start, right? So it's impossible. Secondly, I don't tell people what to do with regard to their relationships. This is me, I think. Just let me fix this. I'm okay here. I'll just check my gear over there. Um, do any of you have iPads on, uh, like stuff that's got Wi-Fi or anything on at the moment? Would you mind just turning the Wi-Fi portion of it off, so that it do or the phone-based portion of it off, so that we don't get clicks in the sound? And I'll just to make sure that everything else is all right here. It's not there. So anyway. Okay, so, the, so if we look at this issue of soulmates, what I'm trying to do is say to people this. God created you, you to be supremely happy. And the way God did it, one of the ways God did it, in fact, was to create you as being a half of you, and eventually you'd find the other half of you, and the other half of you is going to have a very similar passionate desire and nature and personality as you. In other words, you're going to eventually get along really well. <laughs> right? And God created it that way, that you only would have that one person. Does that make sense? Just let me continue. And, and so in creation of that, what God has done is created this concept of soulmates. Now, I didn't create it. So it's impossible for me to break up a family or create a family. I didn't create the concept of soulmates. Um, God did. All I'm doing is telling you about it. <laughs> That makes sense? Secondly, in telling you about it, I'm suggesting to you that when you engage your true passions and desires and engage your true will, not the will to create your facade or your injuries, but your true will, you will engage this process of getting to know you. Once you start doing that, you'll start engaging your life with passionate desire in the areas that you want to go in. And in that process, you will, in fact, draw the other half of yourself to yourself. It's an automatic process. Now, if you're married and the other half of yourself is not the person you're married to, then you're going to eventually still love them, because love would also always dominate every relationship, but you'll realise at the end that the, that the other person is not your soulmate, and so you'll want to leave them. You will. That's a natural thing that will occur. I can't prevent that from occurring. It's going to happen sometime in your future if you're not with your soulmate right now. It's going to happen. And there's nothing I can do to stop it from happening. And from God's perspective, there's probably not much you can do either. All of God's laws have been created to help you discover the other half of yourself. And so sooner or later, you're going to discover the other half of yourself. Does that make sense? The key is what you choose to do out of harmony with love in the interim. If you choose to act in addiction before you meet the other half of yourself, by avoiding or being with people because of wanting certain addictions met, then it's going to slow down the process of you discovering the other half of yourself. So you only create a rod for your own back. That's all you do. And this is all you do with all of God's laws. Every time you work against the way God's created the universe to be, all you're doing is just creating a rod for your own back. No one else's, really, for yourself. And, and if you loved, no matter who you were with, you would treat them lovingly. 
You would never get angry with them and upset with them and dump on them or any of those things. You would, you would always treat them lovingly. So a person who loves would not avoid the process of confronting their fears about meeting their soulmate, but they also wouldn't avoid their fears about being alone. They would process their way through both sets of emotions. Right? And this is something that I feel happens frequently, is that we have very strong emotional addictions because of the fears that we have. And as a result, we often avoid exercising our will in harmony with what we've... Been, that universally, I feel, is demonstrated by now that each of us have a partner of some kind, right? We've been created to be such. So I feel it's a universal creation. If you look at it in nature, you see it in humanity. And, and yet, we still avoid the process of discovering because we're afraid. There are going to be many truths that, you get, that, you, uh, that are presented to you, that you discover through the process of this growth, that you will find confronting. But you will only find them confronting because you have a fear associated with them. That's the only reason why they're confronting. Because God created everything based on love. Now, if everything is created on love, it's impossible for you to get hurt through the process of engaging these qualities. It's impossible. It's only possible to be hurt by not engaging these qualities, actually. By not wanting to grow, by acting in fear, it's only possible to be hurt that way. That's the only way that you can get hurt. In other words, the only way you can get hurt is by using your will to not engage the process of growth of love in your soul. That's the only way you can, at the end, get hurt. And all of the hurts you've experienced up till now have all been the result of somebody or yourself not engaging your will in harmony with love. In other words, someone controlling your will out of harmony with love, such as many of our parents have done, or you controlling your own will out of harmony with love, doing things that are out of harmony with love. That's the only source of potential hurt that there is, in fact. All right? Those two sources. So every time we avoid our fears, we need to start seeing that what we're actually doing is harming ourselves. And if our addictions help us avoid our fears, our addictions, no matter how innocent they seem are harmful to ourselves, to our development. And for that reason, it's very important that at some point we develop the desire to find all of our emotional addictions and release their cause from ourselves. Otherwise, we are preventing our fears using our addictions and we will never be happy, never be the happy people we would like to be. Now, a lot of people believe that they can meet their addictions and become happy. I'm pretty sure the average drug user feels that way, right? Don't they? But what eventually happens to the average drug user, have you noticed? They eventually, many of them even die as a result of their addiction. They are extremely unhappy. They have usually lost most of their friends by the end of the process. They have usually lost most of their will. They are completely under the control of their addiction. And they are extremely unhappy. And this is the result of acting in addictions, whether they be emotional or physical. The result is always going to be more unhappiness. So it's really important for us to see the importance of addressing addictions and to see that they've all been created because of fears, and to develop a desire to find them all ourselves. Not have someone else tell you what they all are, but to actually find them yourself. Right? That's the most important thing you can engage. Now, somebody like myself might be able to feel a lot of your addictions and tell you what they are, but to be honest, if you haven't spent the time trying to find them yourself, it's highly likely you won't even hear a word that that person has said to you. Yep. Very likely. 
And in fact, I've known people now for the last six years, which was, if you think of Lamar's original question, I've known people now who've known me for the last six years. I've had hundreds of hours of conversations with them about their addictions and not a single one of their addictions has ever shifted. Now, how can that happen? It's because their fear is dominating their will to not do anything about their addictions. And it doesn't matter how much I try to convince you that you have a certain addiction, if you have no desire to address it inside of yourself, you will not address it. There has to be some sincere desire that comes from within yourself to address it before you will address the addiction. And it doesn't matter, you know, you can go to as many Tony Robbins seminars as you like. Right? He's not going to convince you to address your addiction unless you have a desire to address your addiction. In other words, you could, you could be with the most you know, flamboyant speaker who's really motivational and at the end of the day, you are not going to address your addiction unless you want to. <laughs> now, in my opinion, you're far better off uh, you know, saving that money that you would have spent going to that person and develop instead your will to find your addictions and see all of your own fears. If we come down to here. If you leave your hand up for us. When you, sp when you speak of finding your will to, to get over your fear, mm -hmm. um, to find your addiction, if someone's in fear, where, where do they start to develop that will? What are the steps of starting to develop that will? Um, yep, that's a very good question. Because the, the reality is for most people, if we're in this emotion of fear, it's highly unlikely we'll even have any will to even look at the fear and that is that is our problem that is a problem that is a very large problem for many people i feel that it all gets down to desire for a loving relationship with god and your soulmate in the end to me that's what drives every decision i make so i have such a strong desire to be in a loving relationship with god and my soulmate that i'm willing to go through every fear that it takes to go through in order to engage those relationships. Does that make sense? Now, when I began this process again in this life, um, it was about, I was, uh, I was 33 years old, so it's 18 years ago, right? I started this process at 33. And at that time, I would have preferred to die than engage my will to find any fear. And that was, that was reality. I, I, I would have preferred to avoid everything. So the question becomes, how do you get from that state, where you just rather not deal with anything, into starting to wanting to develop this desire to have a relationship with God and your soulmate? And I had to go through some personal experiences that the law of attraction brought to me through my condition. My soul condition was one of, I want to shut down everything. And... The law of attraction, of course, brought me a whole series of experiences. And for me, this is what it took. So here's my life. This all that AJ's life. What it took was that I had to lose all my friends. I lose is lose all friends. I had to lose my family. I had to lose my religion. I had to lose my job. I had to lose my children. And I almost had to get to the point where I lost my life. <laughs> and then I realized that there was something wrong. Now, I suggest to you not to wait that long, but this is what happened to me I, before I developed my will in a more positive direction. Does that make sense? And I lost all of these things, all of these things, and I was, uh, 
I eventually was living by myself and um, nobody wanted to be in my life. Now, my children were convinced of not being in my life from other people, but still, in the end, it felt like I lost them, right? And so forth. But many of these things happened through an event, and they all happened at the same time, pretty much. So I got to this point where I was desperate. And it was only when I was desperate that I decided to use my will to examine the reason why I got into this space of desperation. <laughs> Now, why did it need so much to happen for me to get into that state where I was willing to examine? It was because of how big my fear was. So usually the bigger your fear, the more has to happen negatively before you will actually engage your will in a positive direction. Now... If somebody had come along to me before then, before this time when I lost all of these things, and said to me, you know, you need to use your will in a more positive direction, I would have said to him, what do you mean? I reckon I'm using my will in a positive direction as it is. Does that make sense? I would have told him that I felt convinced that he didn't know what he was talking about. And as a result of that, because I wouldn't have listened to him, I had to go through these experiences before I got to use my will in a more positive direction. Now, what I realise now after that experience is this. I could have been open to listening to somebody. In fact, before this time occurred, there were people in my life who said to me that certain things weren't right. And what did I do? I just ignored them. <laughs> right? I had time after time when I could have listened to somebody and then decided to actually engage my will at that point rather than at the point of losing everything. But I didn't. And so I had to get to the point where I was quite low before I realised that there was a problem. Now we can choose to make this choice at any time, but we often don't. We only choose to make it when our life becomes too painful. That's when we make the choice. And that's sad, really, in a way, isn't it? That many of us have to get to be in a lot of pain before we make a different choice. Do you find that sad? Like, it's sad that it has to be that way, but it's a measure of our own resistance, which is a measure of how much fear we have. If I had, before that time, sat down and wrote down all of my fears... Like if, if I'd just done that one thing, just made, made myself a fear list, right? I would have been more conscious of my fears and it's highly likely that I would have began to use my will to start to feel some of them. Right? But I wanted to remain unconscious of all of my fears. In fact, what I used to do, as I've described in some other seminars, I used to, before the next day occurred, I would write down every potential possible problem that I could foresee in the next day occurring based on my plan for that day. And I'd, I'd write them down. And then I would write down every action I would take to avoid those particular things occurring in that day. And so the next day I was completely prepared for the day by having all these fears already all turned into what I would think of possible problems and then coming up with possible solutions that I would actually also write down so that I knew what to do should that problem occur. Right? And I used to live a lot of my life that way. If somebody, was saying, if somebody said to me, AJ, that's all about control. That's all about your fears. <laughs> And what you need to do is make a fear list at least and start looking at your fears and feel them. And if I was convinced enough by that person to do that, I probably would have avoided losing a lot of these things. Now, some of these things, of course, I needed to lose. In fact, I feel pretty much all of those I definitely needed to lose. Except for perhaps that one. But in the end, I also needed to lose those to go through specific emotions. 
And in the end, I look back on it now and I go, okay, that's what I needed to have to get to the point where I was willing to face my problems. If I had been more engaging of life and more engaging of my true desires, I would have found that place earlier in my life. That's reality. But I was too afraid to do that. Yeah. So what happened, finish up happening. But if, if you're a person now listening to this, I'd be going, okay, rather than doing that, let's assume that I must have a lot more fear than I think I do. And let's start to have a look at what those fears might be. And let's start developing a desire to feel them rather than waiting until it gets to such a terrible time in my life that I have to. Now, my personal experience has been that I've had to basically do that with the majority of my emotions. I've had to get to the point where my uh, experience was so bad that I had to look at my fear. And so I'm not afraid of that process now. Like I know that's the process that God's got me in, that every time I ignore a fear, I'm going to attract events which occur, which will trigger this fear. And as long as I'm sensitive and see that and feel that fear, that fear will disappear and my life will change. So I know that now. So I'm not afraid of engaging my life and having fears come up anymore, as I used to be. So like somebody from the UK says, oh, we want you to come over and do a television show or program with us. I go, yeah, no worries. And I know there's a high likelihood that I'll be made fun of if in public, that there'll be millions of people watching and they'll all think I'm an idiot. Right? But I don't avoid it anymore, even though I might be afraid of it. So the best way to address it, I feel, is to allow yourself to take control of this process of getting to know your fears better and already looking at the ones that you've got going on in your life. And the only way you can really do that is by addressing some of your addictions. So one of the things I did once I realised what needed to happen is I got rid of all my addictions. So my job was an addiction, so I got rid of that. My, it was an addiction. I was working 120 hours a week on the average, so I got rid of that. I had four vehicles, so I got rid of all of them, and I rode around on a push bike. <laughs> um, I had, uh, um, at the time, I had, my, uh, I had 13 properties, and uh, I had a lot of funds coming in and out, you know, having to manage that were taking up all my time, and I decided to sell all the properties. Of course, based on my addictions of fear about money, they only sold when I was in dire straits. <laughs> so in other words, when I was behind my, rent, my payments to the bank, you know, by 50 or 60 grand, then I'd sell a property and pay that all off. And then it would only happen to trigger more fears, right? I had fears about all these things. So I had to work through them and allow myself to work through them. But I chose to get rid of all my addictions. That's one of the best things you could do for yourself if you want to address your fears. May I recap my take of what you said then? Mm -hmm. So when you have a fear, when you have your fears, it's good to list them in the fact that you'll know what your fears are, become more aware of them. Yes, because you want to create awareness. Yeah. When you're speaking about controlling all of that, that's not necessarily helpful because then you're, it's a way of avoiding it. Of you, course. So you want to, even though you're scared, go ahead. In take a leap of faith, step yes. forward. Do what you are afraid of. Okay. And then. As long as that thing is loving. Okay. Does that make sense? So, if you want to have sex with 25 different people, I'd suggest that's not very loving. I wouldn't do that, if, even if it's <laughs> what you're afraid of. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then, what I was thinking of as far as something to guide you with, to, to have a guiding point so that when you're in fear you just don't get lost in the darkness is that, would it be accurate to say is to keep in mind the desire to connect with God because that's what I find very easy is to get lost once the fear really kicks in, just to get lost and have no guiding um, yep. no lighthouse to guide by anger is your guide
Every time you're angry, it's telling you you're afraid of something. Anger's your guide. Does that make sense? So I, I don't. When I when you say get lost in your fear, you're now talking about detunement from fear. Like a person who gets lost in their fear lives in their fear. Like, and that is an angry position actually to choose to live in your fear. Do, do you understand why? No? Does anyone understand why it would be an angry position? When we are afraid, what do we want? What, remember, I said, what does what does fear do? It suppresses our will. What what is will going to do? Motivate to us to action. Isn't that not true? Okay. Every time we get lost in fear, it's because we're refusing to act. Does that make sense to everyone? We're refusing to act. So, for example. Your best friend is married. Her husband cheats on her. She's your best friend. You know about it. She doesn't. She believes her husband's a nice, loving man, that they've got the best of relationship. You believe that if you tell her, she'll get angry with you. She won't even believe you. Right? What do you do? If you're living in your fear, you know what you'll do? Nothing. You won't act. You won't act in harmony with love or truth. You won't act in harmony with humility. You won't allow yourself to go through the emotion of losing your friend, if that's what's going to happen, even. You won't do it. You won't act. So every time we're living in our fear, not acting, it's because we're not acting. It's because we're refusing to choose to live a life based on these things. In other words, we're refusing to take action about those things. Every time we refuse action, we are basically going to consign, you know, consign ourselves to being in the fear place for the rest of the time that we choose to not act. And sometimes that's years, sometimes that's hundreds of years. It, you know, there's been many spirits for which that's thousands of years. Why do like there are many relationships on this planet where the husband and wife no, they don't love each other, right? Why don't they leave? Because they are refusing to act. They don't want to act. They're angry. They don't angry. They don't even have to act. Right? They refuse to take a choice. And the reason why they're refusing to take a choice is because they're afraid of something. Right? Every time you get embroiled in your fear and you sort of feel locked up in your fear, it's because you're refusing action. Action that's in harmony with these principles. You're refusing to take it every time. And I've found, I found that the, one of the best ways to get rid of fear is always choose to act in harmony with these things. Even when you're terrified, act in harmony with one of these things. Does that make sense? And your fear, if you're humble, it will just come out of you, you'll experience it, and it will go, it will disappear. But if you don't do that, you can stay in this fear place where you're always there, always there. Every time you think of that thing, you're always worried, you're always concerned, nothing changes, and you, and you actually finish up having your fear dominate your existence. So what I feel is the fourth thing. So anger is your guide telling you every time you're afraid. And the fourth thing is take loving action. Don't refuse to take loving action. Does that make sense? If we go right up the back, or maybe to Mary, you want to say something about it? Yep, so leave it Mary and right up the back there. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that um, third point, because uh, I relate to this idea of getting very lost in fear. And I've learned to recognise not just anger as a guide to my fear, but also confusion is always an indication to me that I'm avoiding a fear. I don't want to uh, acknowledge or recognise a fear, so I get confused. Doubt is exactly the same. It's always when I don't want to face the possibilities in front of me. I'm afraid of facing them, so I just sit in doubt, like it's a choice, like it's a real emotion, and it's not. Um, and also, um, hopelessness 
is often a choice that I take to avoid fear. So I just go, it's all hopeless, instead of recognising there's actually a fear that I don't want to confront. So I just thought that might be helpful to add to that list because mm. I, yeah. And if you think of the hopeless emotion, it's really an angry emotion. You want to be hopeless, you know. You don't want to have to take an action. If you think of confusion, confusion helps you to stop taking actions, right? That's the whole reason for it. We get all confused. Oh, I don't have to do anything now. Doubt is the same. Oh, I've got doubts. No, I don't want to do it now. So oh, it's all about being angry about taking actions in the end. Yeah. It's up the back. Thanks. Can you hear me? Thanks. How you doing? Good. Just curious. I'm trying to understand. Going back to your example of what I can't see now. Sorry? Going going back to your story of all the things that you had to lose in your life, kind of getting away, rid of the things that uh, were preventing you from moving on, quote unquote. Is that what you meant when um, you said 2,000 years ago that you came not to bring love but the sword and that you can't serve two masters, that you've got to pick one? Is that, I'm trying to understand the continuity there. Sure. Um, in the first century, there are some things that I did say that have been misconstrued since. And there are other things that I did say that I had a definite, that have been fairly well retained. So when I said that I came to bring a sword and not to bring peace, what, what I, I didn't actually say those words exactly like that. What I said was that the truth will always, would not always conform itself for the sake of peace. So in other words, telling the truth to someone doesn't always create more peace. It can actually can create a conflict sometimes because if someone's in error and someone has truth, then of course there is going to be a conflict. Now the people in error choose usually to bring the sword. Does that make sense? So, so the, how I spoke it in the first century is that there is error and there is truth. The people who are in error usually want to bring a sword to the people who are in more truth. In other words, they're willing to punish or harm another person. And this is, if you look at it historically, that's what's happened actually. Even the Christian faith has been willing to do that historically. Historically, it entered crusades to force the truth that it thought, it believed, onto other people. Now, in doing so, it proved that it was error. They proved that they were in error. And it's always error that brings the sword, but the truth often confronts that situation. And so that's what I meant in the first century. That got misconstrued greatly by the people who were around me at the time. The issue, though, with regard to the second one, which was, if just remind me again, the second oh, example. Oh, you can't serve two masters? Exactly. Yes, I did say that. You can't serve two masters. You either serve God or you serve whatever is your other master. And I often talked about the other masters. Now, sometimes the masters that people had were money. And in the context of the discussion that that quote was made, I was discussing how people used money as their master. You notice this in, your, uh, in, in most Western world societies, in fact, and in almost all the world now, how money is our master. Like we don't do the right thing because it's too costly to do the right thing. And that's an indication that we've, we're now using money as our master rather than our will to do the right thing as our master. So that's what I was talking about in context in the first century there. But the reality is also I talked about a lot in the first century about fear being people's master. And in fact, what I most of the time tried to do is confront people's fears. So, for example, a man who had lots of money, and I could feel he had lots of money, I would say to him, give all your money away. And then see how you feel. <laughs> right? Give all your money away and then see how you feel. And what that would do is it would confront a addiction related to a fear. That's why I said it. In other, in other cases, like one, one man came to me in the first century and said, look, I, I, don't, I want to follow what you're saying. I want to come around and listen to what you're saying. But I've got to go and bury my father first. Now, he'd already buried his father. And I knew that. Right? And so I said to him, let the dead bury their dead. What, what does that mean? Let the people who are dead spiritually 
go through the emotional process of what they have to do to bury their dead. Because the reality is there's nobody who's ever died. We're all still alive even after we're so-called death. So there's no need to bury your dead, in other words. And if the body's in the ground, that's all you've got to worry about. <laughs> there's no other thing you have to worry about with regard to death. Because the person, the spirit body of the person is still alive. And that's what I was trying to explain to him. But he wouldn't do that because his master was a fear of other people's opinion. So he wouldn't do that. He was afraid of what other people thought of him. So in the book of Luke, there are quotations, particularly in Luke chapter 8 and 16, there are quotations of what I've said about the, about the master issue. And in, in other books, in the book of Matthew, there is quotations about what I said about families and bringing... Uh, disharmony to families now some of those things I said and some of them unfortunately I did not say they were modified later and um, because people had certain opinions and some of those people were the people who listened to me actually so some of the very people who were called my disciples heard one thing and wrote down another now you will find yourself doing this with me very frequently actually if you listen to some of my talks um, you'll, you'll hear one thing and then you listen again to it, you know, a year later, you go, oh, he didn't mean that at all. <laughs> he meant this, actually. And many of you have already been through that process, haven't you? Like where you've heard one time, you thought I said something, and then you've listened again and, and realised I said something else. Now, in the first century, that was very frequently the case. And so what they used to do, and they didn't used to write everything down, and there was no video recording that they could go back to, so they'd just rely on their own memory. And that's why a lot of these things became confused as well. The reality is, we often do have two or more masters, and it's the master we love the most that is the master that will dictate how we use our will. It's actually our loves that determine how we will act. So for the man who has lots of money, it's his love of money generally that's going to determine how he acts. It's going to be the fact. For the man who has no money, it's his desire to get some that might determine how he acts. It just depends on whether he has a love of money or not as that will determine how he acts. Whatever is in our heart is the thing that will motivate our will. So if what's in your heart is to always love, that will motivate your will all the time. But if what's in your heart is sometimes to love, sometimes to get your addiction met, then the times to love, you'll love. And the times to get your addiction met, you'll go and do that instead. That's what you'll do. Whatever is in your heart that you think you love, you will do. Even if it's out of harmony with any other thing, any other thing from God. So a lot of these first century quotations, um, eventually I'll have to correct them all, I suppose, in terms of what they've said. But the majority of them have been taken out of context because the people who were there remembered them poorly or didn't remember them at all. Some of them were insertions, later, uh, hundreds of years later insertions, into the written word. So don't accept everything about what the Bible says about my first century life is actually what happened in my first century life, is the general rule. Ask yourself, what would love have said? Because I was always loving in what I said to people in the first century, always. I wasn't, I wasn't harmful in the way that I stated things. When I say loving, like I did say in Matthew 23, for example, there's quotations of me saying that the, that the scribes and the Pharisees were hypocrites. And I did say that. And it was loving for me to say that because that was what they were. They were hypocrites. I called them whitewashed graves full of dead men's bones, in fact. In other words, what was I talking about there? Their facade. So, so I used that term to describe that the Pharisees and, and Sadducees had a facade. You know, what they were outside was not the same as what they were inside, is what I was getting at. And, that's, and I often refer to facades in colourful, with colourful language to help a person understand what the facade's like. Right? And it was a statement of truth. Inside of themselves, they were full of very terrible emotions that caused a lot of death and destruction around them. And yet on the outside, they were all pious and they would pray to God on the corner of their 
street and so forth in public. And so I was trying to illustrate the danger of the facade, the, the ego, as we talked about earlier. So there are many things that you'll find in the Bible if you reread them with... If you, read, if you read what I'm teaching now and you reread what the Bible says, it's quite obvious in many cases what I was trying to say or what the Bible was trying to recall, my, 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 my saying. Yeah. Does that help at all? Yeah. 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 If we come across to here. We've had your hand a few times. What's the time? Two hours? How many? What's the time? Yeah, yeah. This will be our last question in this part and then we'll go have a break. Um, I had a question in regards to will. Yep. Um, concerning like spirits and God, and like an experience that I had last night in which I kind of broke through some fears, and my will was finally, I think, a desire that is a true desire for me, and I had decided to do it. I had decided to take action. Yep. And almost at that moment, like within minutes, someone came into my life from behind me. That so a spirit? I think it was a spirit, but it was a person. Yeah. But maybe they had a spirit with them where God was directing right. them. Yeah. Is so it was a person in physical that yes, you could a see. a physical person yeah. that had done what I was about to do and that had had a beautiful experience and that basically confirmed everything I had just decided. Yeah. My question is, do you think that that was God or a spirit or... Or was that just, you know, a coincidence? The question I would ask you first is, is what you decided in harmony with God's love? I believe that it is. It okay. feels really right. Is and it too private to say what it was? or? No, um, I decided to walk up the coast yeah. from here probably to San Francisco. Yes. And I had a lot of fear about that because um, I had previously made that decision and I had walked. Um, a decent bit of space and I'd had a lot of um, loneliness that I dealt through yes. and um, I had a, I ended up breaking my leg right which yeah. made me question whether it was right but it really feels like it's what I need to do to address fears that are really deep-seated in me well uh, yeah I personally how, how could such a decision be wrong It's interesting when you ask that question because a lot of times we don't think of it from that case. See, a lot of times I get asked, that somebody says, look, I'm thinking of doing this. Do you think that's okay? And I go, how could it be wrong? Like, I can't see anything. While you're walking up the coast, you can choose to love yourself or not. It depends on what you choose every day, doesn't it, as to what you will do. As you're walking up the coast, you, it would, you would choose to love other people or not, depending on what you choose to do at the, in the moment. There's a high likelihood you will address more emotions as you walk up. That's a very good thing for your soul. So the question I would ask is, how is it not loving? Now, there might be ways that it's not loving. So for example, you might have children of your own that you need to be responsible for, and if you're considering leaving them all behind with nobody to care for them and walk for months on end without, without taking any responsibility for the children you created, then I'd say, well, now we're talking about something that's quite unloving, right? To do to, some, for, to somebody else. Does that make sense? Again, a lot of our choices and decisions are neither right nor wrong until we choose to make certain decisions that are either loving or unloving. To me, a loving choice is always right. <laughs> but there are literally billions and billions, in fact, I believe, an inf infinite amount of loving choices any individual can make. In fact, this is the beauty of the universe in which we live, that God gave us the ability to make billions, and if not infinite, an infinite amount, of choices. Many of which, all of which could be loving. They're just different choices. So it's like asking me, is it okay that I walk to Arizona or shall I walk to Los Angeles or San Francisco? And I would say, well, any one of those two choices is possible. It's also potentially loving. It's also potentially unloving. It just depends on what you choose to do as a result of that choice that you're making. 
doesn't so it? So you don't feel that there's like a highest choice for us, like that's going to bring us to our highest good in that moment? Um, no, I don't believe. What I believe is that God is always wanting us to get to know ourselves and God is always wanting to get to know us. Well, God already knows us, but God is always wanting to share God with us, God, share herself with us. So in other words, God wants us to get to know ourselves and get to know God. Now, in amongst that, there are literally billions and billions of choices you can make. And I do not believe that there is any one person who could advise you and say, that's the right choice, that's the wrong choice. But it, I know for certain that every time you make a choice that's loving, it's always right. Every time you make a choice that's unloving, it's always going to be wrong. <laughs> right? No matter what you choose. So you could choose to go to San Francisco as a walk and choose to do many unloving things along the way and it would have been terrible choices you made. Or you could choose to walk to San Francisco and make many loving choices on the way and it would be a great decision that you made. And this is what God is trying to do with us. God's trying to say, I don't want to control your life. God's trying to say to us, I want you to determine what you want in your own life. And for that reason, God does not tell us what to do. So you don't think that that situation that occurred was a confirmation? You think that that was just sort of something that... No, it was a confirmation. But it was an opinion of a spirit who wanted you to, think, to know that they felt that that would be a good thing for you. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying the opinion of the spirit was wrong. Because I do believe it would be a good thing for you too. If you had asked me, I would have said, yeah, I think that would be a good thing for you. Does that make sense? Just like that spirit does. But that it should not change your decision. Does that make sense? Just because somebody agrees with you. It can be the icing on the top, though. <laughs> sort of like a... Yeah, somebody, basically somebody, your guy probably in this case, is saying to you, I think it would be great for you to do that again. And even though you saw the last walk that you did as, as, a, as a bit harmful in that you broke your leg, in the end, even breaking your leg was, was caused by some things that happened that you chose to do, that you didn't see out of harmony with love. That's all. So, so like your spirit guide wouldn't be worried about you choosing to do something that's going to cause your soul to grow. Does that make sense? Now, what I am concerned about, though, is our sensitivity to the agreement of other people of our choices. Because if you needed the confirmation in order to make the decision, then that's an indication that you're reliant on somebody else's opinion rather than your own. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Now, I would have tried to address that emotionally. Why are you reliant on somebody else's opinion rather than recognizing when, ah, oh, that's a good choice. My soul's going to benefit. I'm going to grow doing that. And I've got no impediments stopping me. I've got no considerations of love that would keep me in my current position. So I'm going to choose to do it. And, uh, and why would you then need the agreement of another person to do it? My suggestion is that can be dangerous in your future because somebody might, you might have an unloving thought and then get confirmation. And then what are you going to say to yourself? That was sort of my fear, yeah, from this experience was what if I have things that are confirmed that are really terrible? Like exactly. It's a bad spirit or something. Yeah, and my feelings are, no, make a choice that is your choice. Make a choice that's your choice. No one else's. All right? Make a choice that's yours. If, if you just put your hand down because it's distracting while I'm talking to you, that's all right. Make a choice that's your choice. Allow yourself to live that choice, but live it in the harmony with love. You know, because every single day you're going to be doing things in that trip that you could choose to be loving as loving things or unloving things to yourself or to others, either way. And my suggestion is choose the loving course every time and it will benefit you immensely. But I actually believe that there's, all, there's so many things that you could choose to do that would benefit you immensely if you chose to do them motivated by love. Not just walk up the coast. Do you know what I mean? You, you could choose to start a business that's totally motivated by love. You could choose to, you know, 
go the opposite side of the world and serve somewhere over there, motivated by love. You know, there's all sorts of things you could choose to do. In fact, God gave you a playground that's pretty big. It's called the universe. And God gave you this playground so that you could make billions and billions of different choices. The key is what are are going to be your motivations? Are they going to be love or are they going to be selfishness or other negative motivations? Now, if if at the moment you believe they're love, then do them. And then halfway through them, you work out, oh, maybe I was a bit of an addiction here. Then stop. (laughs) Because you can always change your mind (laughs) with a choice as well, right? You're allowed to. God gave you the will so that you can change your mind. So don't be too concerned about mistakes. See, at the moment, if I told you it was a mistake, what would you do? Now, if I'm someone you respect, and I'm not someone a lot of people respect, of course, (laughs) but if I'm someone you respect, then you would probably listen to me. I would really reconsider it. If you had had been negative, I would have really... And I, would, and I see that as a problem. Why would you seriously consider it just because of my opinion? The only time I would seriously consider what somebody else is saying to me is based on whether they could offer evidence to me that it's not loving. That's a different matter. If someone offered evidence to me that it wasn't loving, then I would definitely consider it every time. But if someone is just giving me their personal opinion... It's of little consequence to my decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you're finding yourself being like valuing their opinions over your own choices, even though there is no proof that your opinion was unloving in the first place, then I suggest there's a need for external approval. That's an addiction that needs to be addressed. Yeah. But many times our guides will confirm to us, you know, oh, I think that's a great choice. Go for that. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't mean they're saying to us, if you don't do it, it would be a terrible thing. Because there's lots of things you could choose to do that's unharming with love in the course of a day that will help you grow. Yeah. Now, I said that was the last question before we had a break. So we, you guys need to have a break. So what is the time right now? 20 to 4? Is everyone okay with about a half an hour break? So if we came back at, say, quarter past four, is that okay with everyone? Yeah? No? Yeah? Okay? No worries. So quarter past four, let's make it.